Thank you. I'll call this meeting to order, and I would ask that everyone silence their electronic devices. And I understand that some of you may be here to listen to the discussion on the site alteration permit for Port Colborne Quarry. That item is not on the agenda this evening. Uh, we hope that it will be on the item on the May 27th meeting, but that's tentative at this time. Uh, we are awaiting comments to be received from the province. If you would like further information or would like to register as a delegate, please contact the clerk's office on the first floor of City Hall. But as always, everyone is uh, welcome to stay for this meeting. We have, we, have two, yeah, we have two hearings under the Planning Act this evening. We have a, a committee of the whole and a uh, council meeting this evening. This time, if we can stand for the National Anthem, as provided by McKay Public School. Seconder to confirm the agenda. Councillor Wells, Councillor Bruno, any questions? All those in favor? It's carried. Any disclosures of interest in the two planning meetings? Okay. We have a public hearing under the Planning Act, official plan amendment, and application for zoning bylaw amendment, planning and development department, planning division report number 2019 64. Public meeting report for official plan amendment D09-01-19 and zoning bylaw amendment D1403-19, 170 Welland Street, city lands on Lake Road and Transport Canada lands on the east side of the Welland Canal. Okay, Evan. Uh, yeah, sorry, Your Worship. We're just not certain what happened to the uh, attendance sign-in sheets that um, that Heather had brought with her. Uh, but sorry for the interruption here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so sorry. I will uh, get started um, while Heather sorts that out. So uh, we're here for a um, public meeting for. Uh, Applications D09-01-19 and application D14-03-19. It is for an official plan and a zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, so the purpose of this meeting, pursuant to sections 22 and 34 of the Planning Act, is to consider an application initiated by the City of Port Colborne for the properties known as Part Lot 27, Concession 1, formerly in the Township of Humberstone, now in the City of Port Colborne, Regional Municipality of Niagara, municipally known as 170 Welland Street, but also municipally known as South Side of Lake Road, and uh, all lands under the federal government ownership on the east side of the Welland Canal. Uh, the application for official plan amendment proposes to change the designation of these lands in the East Waterfront Secondary Plan from parks and open space to industrial areas. Uh, the application for zoning bylaw amendment proposes to change uh, the zoning at 170 Welland Street from Park, or sorry, P-CH, which is shorthand for Public and Park with Conversion Holding, uh, 
Uh, so it is proposing to change the zoning from P-CH to light industrial, and this is for 170 Welland Street. Uh, and the zoning for the Transport Canada lands will change from P-CH to heavy industrial. And the zoning for the city-owned land on Lake Road will change from light industrial to heavy industrial. Um, method of notice. Notice of the public meeting was administered in accordance with sections 22 and 34 of the Planning Act as amended and section 3 of Ontario Regulation 543-06 and section 5 of Ontario Regulation 545-06. The notice of public meeting was circulated to required agencies and property owners within 120 meters of the property on April 23, 2019. Public notice signs were posted on the properties on April 23, 2019. Um, public notice was also posted on the city's website on April 23, 2019. And finally, a public notice appeared in the Port Colborne Leader on April 25, 2019. Uh, staff hosted a public open house on April 29, 2019. Uh, the open house was attended by a number of residents and property owners um, from the East Village. It's just a Explanation of the procedure that will be followed tonight, Your Worship. Uh, the procedure to be followed this evening will be uh, a presentation of P Department of Planning and Development Report 2019-64, which is just the public information report, not the recommendation report. Uh, we will receive questions of clarification from Council, uh, or uh, and also we will then, or sorry, we'll subsequently open the meeting to the public for comments and questions. Uh, we will announce requirements under the Planning Act for written notice of passage of the proposed zoning and official plan amendments and a brief explanation of future meetings regarding this application. Um, so we're on to the presentation of the application for zoning bylaw amendment and so at this time I would like to present Planning and Development re uh, Department Public Hearing Report 2019-64. Okay, so the uh, location and context and the subject properties are, are uh, outlined in green. Um, the uh, subject properties are located on the west side of Welland Street and the south side of Lake Road. Uh, the properties are currently vacant uh, except for an industrial facility at 170 Welland Street. Um, the properties are located in the East Village neighborhood of Port Colborne and are predominantly surrounded by residential uses with some commercial uses on the east side of Welland Street and the north side of Lake Road. Um, there's also some vacant land on the north side of Lake Road. Uh, and to the uh, west side of the subject property is the, the Welland Canal, uh, and between the Welland Canal and the, uh, the western edge of the subject property is um, various industrial applications uh, used or uh, on land owned by Transport Canada that is associated with the Welland Canal. Um, and then kind of in between uh, the two uh, non-contiguous parts of, of the subject property is Allied Marine and Industrial, a light industrial uh, manufacturing facility. Um, so in the uh, city's official plan, which is actually the East Waterfront Secondary Plan, which is part of our official plan, uh, the property is designated as parks and open space. Uh, land uses in the parks and open space designation include public landscape open space, playgrounds and sport sports fields not administered by a school board, cultural and recreational facilities such as arenas, museums, halls, swimming pools, docks, and publicly operated golf courses, uh, linear parks and public open spaces such as multi-use trails and pathways and on-road bicycle routes. The application for official plan amendment proposes to change the official plan designation to industrial areas. Land uses in the industrial areas designation include manufacturing and fabricating, assembling, processing, servicing and repairing, warehousing and storage, shipping and receiving, offices as an accessory or secondary use, commercial activities that provide amenities to employees during the workday, as an accessory use, uh, medical marijuana production facility, uh, industrial activities related and proximate to the canal and harbor such as ship dockage and repair, and accessory uses such as parking garages. Uh, 
the current zoning of the property um, is uh, all of them except for the city owned property just immediately south of Lake Road. All of the properties are currently zoned parks with conversion holding, the city owned property being the exception which is zoned light industrial. Uh, so the park with conversion holding zone uh, permits a cemetery, community garden, conservation use, cultural facilities, food vehicle, park, public uses, recreational use, and uses and structures accessory there too. The conversion holding symbols uh, require a record of site condition to be filed with the Ontario Ministry of the Environment um, before public and park zone uses can be established on the property. Uh, the city-owned land on Lake Street is zoned light industrial. Light industrial uses uh, permit adult-oriented entertainment establishment, car wash, contractor's yard, crematorium, education facility, industry light, medical marijuana production facility, motor vehicle repair garage, public use, research facility, transportation depot, and uses structures and buildings accessory there too and does not include obnoxious, dangerous, or offensive trades. Uh, so the zoning uh, for the property at 170 Welland Street, and that's the um, property outlined in uh, blue on the screen, uh, is proposed to change to light industrial, which is the uses I just read. Uh, the zoning of the remaining properties, those outlined in um, magenta, say, are um, proposed to change to heavy industrial. Uh, so the heavy industrial uses include everything that I just read for light industrial, um, and plus bulk fuel depot, car wash, contract, uh, no, sorry, some of these are included. Um, basically heavy industrial uses in addition to all of the light industrial uses, uh, which would include um, uh, heavier manufacturing type uses, uh, plus bulk fuel depot. Uh, so Purpose of this application, uh, at its January 28, 2019 meeting, Council provided the following direction to staff, that planning and development staff be directed to bring forward applications under the Planning Act to propose changes in land use for certain properties within the East Waterfront Secondary Plan that are federally and privately owned from parks and open space to industrial slash employment purposes. And just a recap of the purpose of the application, uh, the, the official plan amendment will change the uh, designations from parks and open space to industrial areas. And the zoning bylaw amendment application will change uh, zoning from parks and conversion holding uh, to light industrial at 170 Welland Street and uh, the remaining properties from parks and conversion holding to heavy industrial. Um, with the exception of the city-owned land, which will change from light industrial to heavy industrial. Okay. Now, public comments. Uh, just a note here that um, we received uh, several, several comments, as you can see from the list. I believe that they have all been circulated in full to council. Uh, a few of them have come in um, possibly after that, uh, that circulation was sent uh, at midday. Uh, and so I will confirm with the clerk tomorrow to ensure that every written comment is indeed circulated. Uh, some of them also came to planning staff directly instead of clerk's department, so I will touch base. But um, the list up here is, is the, the, uh, the record of, of all of the comments we've received uh, up until about um, 5 p.m. Uh, so I will just um, read a truncated version of, of each comment that we received. Um, but like I said, comments in full are available and will be appended to the, uh, the recommendation report. Uh, so first we have uh, Larry Rosnuck at 62 Fraser Street, uh, and he's commenting that the application should be delayed for additional input, and he'd like to see heavy industrial change to light industrial with a bird sanctuary at the southern end of what uh, we're calling the slag spit um, to be protected with public access along Lake Erie shoreline. Um, Debbie Gravel at 177 Welland Street is, uh, lives directly across from 170 Welland Street, uh, concerned about drop in property value uh, resulting from, from the changes and concerned about potential businesses using 170 Welland Street and impact on her property. 
Uh, Tina Whitwell at 83 Welland Street, concerned about decline in property values and ability to sell property if applications are approved. Concerned about noise, traffic and pollution from sites diminishing enjoyment of property. Uh, Loretta Vanderhoek at 117 Fair Street, um, uses on property unsightly, view from West Street is not sightly for tourists. Concerns about dust and health issues with wind blowing material stored on site into East Village. Um, concern about ability to sell home if applications are approved. Glenn Hamilton at 217 Welland Street. Concern about pollution, noise, odor, traffic, and other impacts on residents. Um, Michael Tenzin, uh, 2-576 Field and Avenue. Um, says that this is a great opportunity for the city to create a large lake and canal side park with bird sanctuary at this property. Um, proposed to establishment of heavy industrial park on the site due to concerns about impact on natural environment uh, and that there are other locations uh, for an industrial park in Port Colburn. Um, David Henderson, concerns about intake source for municipal water system and impact industry may have um, on the water supply. Notes that the intake protection zone uh, in Port Colburn is uh, considered to be the most vulnerable in Niagara. Uh, Tracy uh, Pibus, uh, and I apologize for uh, any mispronunciations of names, it's not my intention. Uh, Tracy Pibus at 187 Oakwood Street, uh, opposed to change to industrial uses, would like to see more green space added. Uh, Tina Gifford of no, uh, sorry, no address given. Um, there's a strong legacy of industrial contamination in Port Colburn, is opposed to the application and would prefer to see green space, residential, and parks. Uh, Linda and Harry Talving, uh, no address given. Would like to see protection for bird habitats at the southern end of the slag spit, as it, in, as it, in, sorry, as it is an important nesting area for gulls, uh, and would prefer to see remaining land rezoned to light industrial instead of heavy industrial. Inns Munt of 35 Canal Bank Road, um, moved to Port Colburn for environment and lifestyle, uh, sees great potential for tourism, wondering why the city is taking a step back in converting parkland to industrial land, and concerns about pollution and contamination. Um, Mr. Stengel of uh, 192 Fair Street, opposed to rezoning, neighborhood is impacted by other industrials, other, industri other industries in the area, does not want to see expansion, um, and concern about the bird nesting area. Leo Talving, no address given, would prefer to see light industrial instead of heavy industrial. Uh, in the southern portion of Slag Spit is an important bird area that should be protected. Barbie Horton, no address given, opposed to application, concerned about water contamination, air quality, noise, and dust. Irene Sinko of 196 Fair Street, opposed to application, would prefer to see something that, would, that will improve the east side. Catherine Perry, no address given, uh, prefers original vision stated in the East Waterfront Community Improvement Plan, feels proposed application will take the city in opposite direction and is opposed to the application. Uh, Mitch Carrier of 173 Welland Street has owned property across the street for over 20 years. Pollution, noise and dust from existing industries is an, is an ongoing problem for his tenants. Um, adding more industrial uses will make the problem worse. Uh, concern about impact on property value, concern about impact on West Street Canal Days and tourism. Um, the application will negatively impact the quality of life in the East Village uh, and is opposed to the application. And finally, uh, Robert Jabari of 131 Welland Street is opposed to the application, lives across the street and will be directly impacted. Uh, light and heavy industrial uses are, is not correct fit for the neighborhood. Priority should be environment and residents concerned about property value, water, and air quality. Um, agency comments that we've received uh, to date, the drainage superintendent has no concerns. Uh, the regional municipality of Niagara has requested an extension for submitting comments, which um, I have granted um, and believe that con comments from the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority are also forthcoming. Um, so at this time, Your Worship, uh, we're now into the questions of clarification to planning staff. Um, 
So I'm wondering if there's any, or any questions of clarification for myself. And before we open the, public, the meeting to the public, I'd like to read the following. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Port Colborne before a decision on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is passed by Council, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the City of Port Colborne Council to the local planning appeal tribunal. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Port Colborne before a decision on a proposed zoning bylaw amendment is passed by Council, uh, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal unless in the opinion of the tribunal there is reasonable grounds to do so. And I should say I mentioned zoning bylaw amendment in both of those paragraphs. The same applies for the official plan amendment. Uh, and finally, if there's uh, any interested members of the public, there is a sign-in sheet at the back of the room. Uh, we've located it. Uh, it is back there, uh, so please sign in to uh, request future notices regarding this application. I will note that anyone that has submitted written application thus far and given us an address or an email address, we already have your contact information and you will be receiving uh, notice of future public meetings. Um, so at this time, Your Worship, I'd like to invite... Uh, Councillors. Councillors, exactly, <laughs> to uh, ask any questions of, that they may have for staff. We have Councillor Bruno, then Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Worship. Through you to the planner. Um, Evan, I'm just wondering for context, can you bring back the um, drawing of the area? So can you um, advise Allied Marine is there? Is that light industrial? Allied Marine is, uh, sorry, yes, it is light industrial. It is the and LI um, that is right. highlighted. And so the area of city land in the, um, what is that, aqua purple there? Yes. Is that, um, so that's um, north of Allied? Uh, the city-owned land is, is actually kind of south southeast of, um, of of Allied, if I okay. may, just it's this um, okay. parcel there. I'm, st I'm still concerned. So the, the, the blue is um, the Dewar property? That's correct. And yeah. just beyond that, I just see that as a cross from residential, and that is going to be uh, upload or potentially uploaded to uh, heavy industrial? Uh, that would go to heavy industrial, yes, as, as proposed right now. I don't know if you're going to be answering these tonight, but the city's rationale for that? Um, the rationale is, is really to permit a wide variety of industrial uses on, on the property. Um, but we're open to, uh, to comments and, and direction uh, to change our recommendation. I think you've got to delineate that very naturally to be across from residential um, I, I think that's a, that's a step too far, as far as I, I'd see. Um, <laughs> the, other, the, other, Gary, the other question I'm Gary, sorry. in the blue, which is the Dewar property, that's light industrial. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, the other question I have is, embedded in light industrial is marijuana grow up, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. So can that, can light industrial zoning have exemptions where we could exempt that out? Uh, absolutely, there's, we could have a special provision that would prohibit um, uses that are permitted in light industrial elsewhere in the city to be uh, prohibited from being established in this area. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to be on record as opposed to that okay. uh, in that area. Um, that's all for now. Thank Mayor. you. Councillor Demeray? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you uh, to Evan. Evan, there's, there's a couple of things I'd like to see happen here um, as a result of the, the communications we've received from the public. On top of the 18 that you've mentioned tonight, I, I had 11 personal uh, emails and about 29 phone calls. So um, the public is clearly concerned with what's going on. So um, first of all, I'd like to see us take the door piece out the door metals piece out and deal with that separately if there's a way that we can separate that out from the process and create two processes okay. um, to do that. Um, we could deal with that 
sooner than later. The rest of the properties, I'd like to see those get tabled for a while until such time as Councillor Beauregard and I have had a chance to uh, schedule some public meetings with the neighborhood people and uh, hear their concerns, explain what's going on, be able to explain to them exactly why this is happening, how this came about, um, the definitions of the various uh, land uses, and uh, hear what they want to see happen with the property. I, I do believe that if we learn nothing else from what we've, what's happened in the last couple of years, we need to understand that people need to come first. So let's hear them first. Let's deal with that. <laughs> and then let's move on with the process. And it, I'll, we can, Councillor Beauregard and I can bring back all the comments and concerns, the questions, to staff and to council. And then decision can be made as to where to go from there. Um, you could maybe advise as to how we can make that happen. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Evan? That's a good idea. Uh, so we could have a direction from council to table the uh, the um, everything except the door property uh, at this point, and uh, we can then proceed with the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment for the door property, independent of, of the remaining properties. That that would be wonderful. I would also like to. Uh, Go on record with Councillor Bruno. No medical marijuana uh, facility and no adult entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Councillor Wells. Through you, your, your worship, to uh, Evan. Um, in the uh, planning, uh, the uh, provincial policy statement uh, requires, and the Ministry <coughs> of the Environment. Uh, require uh, a com uh, consideration for the separation distance from various industrial groups. Uh, in specific, in this one here, we're looking at uh, a heavy industrial and a light industrial in very close proximity to uh, sensitive land uses, the residentials. Um, has that been taken into consideration into this, or are there any exemptions that we have uh, for this or any mitigation processes that we can use uh, in order to uh, accommodate that? Uh, so through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Wells, the, the challenge is that um, at this point no specific industrial types have been proposed for, for any of the application, or sorry, for any of the properties. Um, so we, it's difficult to ascertain what the separation distance is going to be required in absence of, of actually knowing what the specific industry is going to be. Um, that said, we would prefer to see these properties under site plan control, which would then require um, uh, planting and, and defensing, screening, uh, other methods to mitigate the, the impact that the, uh, the properties would have on the uh, residential neighbors. Excuse me, some of us have hearing problems and I did hear um, Councillor Wells well and Councillor Desmaris, but the public is, um, is, is an important part tonight. Could you please be very loud and clear? Because we have a great large public. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. To, uh, to, to restate my, my answer to Councillor Wells, uh, we don't have any specific industrial uses proposed for the, the, uh, for the properties at this point. The application is just to change to industrial zoning. So in absence of knowing the specific industrial uses, we can't um, properly ascertain what the required setbacks would be, um, but staff would prefer to see uh, site plan control imposed on these properties that would uh, introduce some um, buffering, landscaping, and, and other methods to soften the impact of the industry uh, uses on the residential neighborhoods. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah. We'll tell them to speak up. Just nobody out there speaks, and everybody can hear him, please. So speak louder, please. Up. Okay. Thank you. Start over again. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, in absence of uh, of knowing the specific industrial uses that will be, uh, in, that uh, sorry, uh, staff has not been made aware of any specific industrial uses for these properties at this point. Uh, as such, we don't know what. Uh, the appropriate measurements or setbacks will be uh, as they are dependent on the industrial use. Um, but staff would prefer to see these properties under site plan control and that would impose um, mitigating measures such as planting, landscaping and fencing to soften the impact of uh, industrial uses on residential neighbors. 
Okay, Councilor? Uh, through your worship, um, the um, ministry guideline, if I'm not correct, um, stipulates the lowest class of class one, which what I would assume to be, well, I know is, is at least light industrial. Uh, 20 meters is the minimum separation distance from property line to property line. And I don't think we have that here, so I would ask that, that we really consider this when we um, go about to uh, really finalize this uh, zoning. Okay. Yep. Okay. Councilor Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, Devin, and just to pick up on Harry's uh, our request for what it would take on setbacks. Can we get a map that shows, you know, distances, so we can, you know, visually see what a heavy industrial would do to that? It may squeeze it so much that it really uh, doesn't make much sense. But if we could see that on a future map that you're going to bring forward, uh, absolutely, we can do that. That's something you can get to us yep. sooner than later. Correct? Absolutely. Thanks, Evan. Councilor Flayla. Through you, Your Worship, to Evan. Could I just ask a question? I'm wondering, these lands were originally industrial, is my understanding from what I was reading. They were turned to parkland, so I'm wondering why we're turning them back to industrial when, why weren't they made into parkland? Is there a reason that, that we're going back to where they were before when we decided at some point to change them to the parkland? Evan? Well, it was a direction from council to proceed with these, with these applications. Um, I, I can't speak for why previous councils have not undertaken uh, acquiring these properties and commencing with the conversion to parkland. Um, but the direction we received from council was to change from parkland to industrial. So when I was reading through the CIP and the, the East Village uh, documentation, there were a lot of things that had been proposed, but I'm assuming that none of them came to fruition. There were, there's no interest in, in developing those lands as parklands or any, anything else besides industrial? Do we uh, have any other opportunities? Through, uh, through your, your worship, that was really more of a discussion for council. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just providing Thank the, you, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor Borgard. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to you, Evan. The, the only thing I really have to comment on at this point in time is uh, I don't think there's any appetite whatsoever for heavy industry. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that should be at all considered at all in, in this application. Thanks. Yeah. So, so Evan, obviously that's a direction, I think, get coming out of these discussions that they would rather look at portions of that property being a light industrial as opposed to heavy industrial. Yes. That's what I'm hearing from councillors with further information coming forward. Yeah. Councillor Baggio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, I'd like to ask Evan, Transport Canada owns part of this property. Have they come forward with the application of rezoning or is the city acting as an agent for Transport Canada or how does that work right now? Uh, so there's a bit of a constitutional divide there in that the federal government does not need to recognize um, our zoning bylaw. Uh, so the application was, was initiated by city. Uh, Transport Canada has been made, made aware. Uh, St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation has been made aware. Um, they've provided no feedback at this point. Um, the some of these lands may be, and I have to stress, may be um, divested by Transport Canada in the future. Uh, and so I'm going to anticipate that there, sorry, that this application is anticipation of, of, that, um, of that divestiture taking place. Okay. Anything further? No? Okay. Evan? Okay, thank you, uh, Your Worship. So now we are, uh, at this time, I'd like to invite members of the public who wish to speak to this application uh, to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have four uh, speakers that have pre, um, put their name in 
earlier to speak, so they'll go first. Our first speaker is Larry Rosnick, 6266 Welland Street. Come up to the podium, please. And Larry, the clerk reminded me that you asked me to give you a two-minute warning, so I'll give you that. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, thanks. So um, some of my concerns have been um, answered already. Um, through you to the planner, did you say that the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority has been told about this and they haven't made a submission yet? That's correct. Okay, thank you. That solves that. So I put in a 37-page uh, submission here to council. I hope everybody's um, got involved in looking at this or will. Mm -hmm. And I would like to thank uh, Alderman or Councillor Demaray for mentioning that um, people come first. And, uh, you know, I outlined this with, from the Municipal Act with respect to duties of councillors and the mayor. And um, with respect to the East Waterfront Community Improvement Plan, when this was put in place back in or the, the debate and the meetings were held in 2012, um, I believe due diligence of the planning department, because I believe we have a good city staff here, the due notice was given to everybody involved with this. Everybody, there were a number of public meetings, et cetera. If anybody had a complaint about what was going on, they certainly had a chance at the time. Uh, can you hear me, folks? Okay. Um, you know, to respond. And um, if people had a problem, they should have done that. And I, I, it seems the whole community was in favor of this. And I think probably what's happening here is that, um, you know, the motion originally by Antje Demaray uh, and Councillor Beauregard um, and I'm surprised that the, the mayor and the city uh, uh, CEO uh, allowed this to happen, but it, it's, it's ambiguous. I mean, when you use words like certain and just industry, and yet here we find out there's light and heavy, and, um, you know, I think when things are ambiguous and not to the point in uh, talking about what exactly you want to do, um, you know, there, there's, there's a, you know, abuse can happen. I mean, things can get twisted around and changed. And... Um, you know, I understand where they're coming from. You know, they're talking about, um, oh, you know, industrial employment. And, of course, everybody wants jobs, and I, I respect them for what they're doing. You know, I think this is quite good. Um, but I've, uh, I've given you a, a definition of certain, you know, for what that word is, and it's quite complicated. And also um, there's something in legal process called um, abuse of process, and um, this is applicable in um, legal and civil terms. And... Uh, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know whether this is applicable in planning and uh, the way the Municipal Act reads. But um, since most people seem to be against heavy industry, I'll skip by that. And I've given the uh, information in the package concerning the information that um, the planner, Mr. Abs, gave. But what I would like to do is bring to your attention, and I've asked um, a slide of this to be presented, and if you have my package, it's the last page of my 37-page document, and essentially it's dealing with hazard lands. Do we have that up on? Anyways, hazard lands, if you look at this map, and this wasn't, it was presented at the information meeting, but it wasn't on any of the documents, it wasn't in the newspaper, and um, essentially if you look at it, if it comes up here, whoop, that's not it. Oh yeah, here it is, there you go. So if you look at this in the file I gave you, all of these lands down here and all of this, you can see they're, fine, they're hash marked. And this is considered hazard lands, and it's the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority that I believe has, um, are, is responsible for these lands. And permitted uses in hazard lands are boathouses, boat ramps, conservation uses, dock, existing ag agriculture uses, flood and erosion protection works, forestry, passive recreation use and public use. Now these lands are hazardous because the lake ebbs and flows. The wind blows, the ice comes and goes, and these lands, you can't build on them because eventually you're gonna get flooded out. And this is an extremely important process for the way the lake functions. I mean, as more people barricade their properties to stop erosion, we know we have high water, flooding everywhere, we just had to make a repair to our dock. And of course, I would suggest that if the Niagara Peninsula Conservation came and did another mapping of this area, 
they'll find that this hazard zone has increased even more. More, and I would suggest that these lands should be left to their natural function. <laughs> I've also um, included a couple of um, uh, documents here from the National Wildlife Federation. And um, it talks about the watersheds in the Great Lakes and that um, some of the animals and some of the birds. And of course, the, 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 cul the gulls that are there are protected. And um, the whole mandate of this group is to restore the Great Lakes, reduce pollution causing climate change, guarding water quality, and connecting kids with nature. I think this is very important. I took my children out to these hazardous lands when they were young. And we had to we put on sunglasses, hats, and long pants and sleeves, and of course, earplugs. Because when you go out to this nesting colony, which um, according to the uh, Port Coven Breakwater and Mainland report from the Ontario government, states that the ring bill gulls nest primarily on the mainland site. In 1990, there was 43,590 pairs, 10,000 birds. No, sorry, 100,000 birds are sitting there with their young. Now, this is the second largest nesting ground on the Great Lakes. It's an asset that most people do not know about. It's something that we can use to bring in tourism. Point Pelee is the only place bigger that has this. And from what I read, if you follow this diagram, there's, it's 4% of all the gulls on the entire North American continent. Now, I think this is important to maintain. And as everybody said in all their documentation and whatnot, nobody is against light industry. And Allied Marine is a good example of this. They moved over there. They owned their land. They built a nice factory. It's clean. I've been in it. Their workers are highly skilled workers, and the equipment is top of the line. There's no garbage. There's no junk. There's nothing on their land. They take pride in the work they do and the way they present themselves in public. And I think this has to be encouraged. Now, also, there's a... a something here that talks about fines for enforcement of these kind of lands is joined by the CWS, MR, MNR, and the RCMP. And the maximum penalties for a corporation to disturb these lands is $250,000. For an individual, it's $100,000 or imprisonment for five years or both. Now, these are recognized, and this has to be protected. We have to use this as a resource. If we use the city land that is going to heavy industry of all things, I can't believe it, as a little parking place, and if you look at the last diagram that I had there, we had a little a walkway, just enough for people, maybe a bicycle, to get access to the southern part of this, use it as a conservation area with a viewing stand. This is a sight to behold, and you can't believe the noise. This is one of the wonders of the natural world to have a rookery like this in Port Coburn. And right. it would bring thousands of people in when they're nesting to go down there. You'd have to fence them in, put a roof on, because there's all these bird droppings periodically. <laughs> but to go in there and do a selfie or take a film or whatever, this is a marvelous opportunity for the city. It should be looked at. It should be explored. Now, I also included a little article about from the Hamilton Spectator. The title is, Is Hamilton Set to Become King of the Great Lakes Superhighway? Now, a question was mentioned earlier. Why are we doing this? You know, who wants to come in and do this? I'm suggesting this is pressure from the federal government. We are doing their dirty work, and they want to claim all the canal lands, if you look at the articles online, all along the Welland Canal and everywhere. Now in Hamilton, Hamilton had, I think it was called the East Harbor Front Improvement Area. One minute, Larry. It was supposed to be two. Thank you very I much, Your Honor. I told you it too, so. Hmm? I told you it too. Oh, I didn't hear. Anyways, what I'm saying is that we have an opportunity here. It's already mentioned to delay this proposal, to get more public input, and look at some sanity for the well-being of our water, our ecosystem, the birds, and of course of all, the health and well-being of the people of the city. And I certainly encourage council to move forward with more uh, meetings and make a different recommendation and definitely eliminate heavy industry from anything other than the 
one that is already there. I thank you for your time. Thanks, Larry. Our second speaker uh, is Janet Henderson, 2199 Babion Road. I believe I sent my questions in. I'm not sure if it got in in time to be up on the screen. Um, my question tonight is, who on council initiated this request? It, council in general is not specific enough for me. I would like to know who on council initiated this zoning request. And I'm not sure to whom I should direct that question. Everything's directed through the chair. Okay. There okay. you go. I asked staff to, or uh, councillors asked the two uh, ward councillors to bring this forward. Okay. And Why? Well, first piece of land which Mr. Dewar owns, it was taken from what he uses it for now. Uh, my understanding, what he described to me, that he wasn't told it was going to parkland. It never was parkland. It's been light industrial for as long as probably any the oldest person in this room is. So he came to us because he has a pending sale to have it changed. Um, okay. It's land that sits along the canal. It would never become parkland. Regardless so, of the 2012... East Regardless canals. of the 2012, that's land that can be, uh, that the Seaway would tell you they won't allow it to be parkland. They'll want it for use for marine use along the canal. Okay, so then the next why um, is, is this perhaps through our MP, because someone mentioned federal direction, uh, because the Hamilton Port Authority is looking for industrial land because Burlington Bay looks like it looks, and now we want to look like that too? Uh, no. No? No. All right. Is council aware that the current city municipal water intakes score a 9.0 and 8.1 for risk of contamination, which are the highest scores in the region, and putting industrial land within 300 meters of our water intake risks the health of our city water. I'm on city water. So um, that is my biggest concern. So are you aware of our risk contamination for our water intakes, making this industrial land? I'm, I'm aware. I don't know if other councillors have read the NPCA report. Okay. I'm aware of it. So you're, however, a, you're aware you, you've got to you remember that these are federally owned lands, they could come in tomorrow and resurrect an Algoma steel plant there and we couldn't have anything to say about it. We're trying to mitigate this and as Councillor Bruno said first and Councillor Demeray specifically looked at light industrial for a portion of this, some of this property. So we're trying to get it so that we can have some control over this. But you included the heavy industrial. That's because that's what it was before. So when it comes to us as a public meeting, that's when we give direction to staff to make those changes, which is what Councillor Demeray has asked. Because you are aware that um, putting industry next to water intakes is against the NPCA water source protection? The well, water source I, protection um, is says you don't put industry next to water intakes for city water. That we'll wait for from the NPCA. Okay. And there has been a formal, because obviously you haven't had NPCA approval for these changes, but you do know, uh, or you have requested NPCA approval for these plans? Evan? Uh, so, sorry to interrupt, but through you, uh, Your Worship, yes, the NPCA was notified on April 23rd um, when the public notice was sent out, and the NPCA is a commenting agency, not an approval agency for zoning bylaw and official plan amendment applications. Thank you. Okay. That's it. I just needed on record that you're aware of the of the possible contamination to our city water by doing this. Thank you. Third delegation is Lori Vanderen, 5489 Shirkson Road.
Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm going to start with that I'm opposed to it, but I'm going to explain to you where I've been and where I've lived and what I've seen. And I, I have a, it, it makes me question where you guys are going with all of this. So I grew up in Chippewa. Everybody knows where Chippewa is. Um, we had heavy industrial next to the creek when I was a kid growing up. Between the Love Canal and the Norton, we ended up with toxic tar blobs in our water. It's very well documented. It was cleaned up, but it still happened. We had chemicals coming in. If they were separated, they would have been fine. But because the chemicals from Love Canal coming down to the Niagara River and everybody else's uh, chemicals coming into the creek. Now what happens is when you have certain chemicals, they bind to each other and they, they cause uh, all this excess tar blobs and chemical blobs. They actually burned people when they were jumping in the water. We, I, I swim in the creek to this day. Problem is industrial on a creek or on a waterway. Second place I lived was Niagara-on-the-Lake. I lived on Lakeshore Road on lakefront property in Niagara-on-the-Lake. Now, for years when we first moved out there, 1992, we didn't have access to our beachfront. We actually didn't have a beachfront at the break walls. We couldn't put our boat directly in that water because it was so polluted because of the, the water sewage places and everything else. They cleaned it up with the revitalization of Port Weller in St. Catharines. Now, this is where I find a lot of this in the city planner. Why you went from industrial to parks, or light industrial, and now you're going backwards. If any, I, I tell everybody to go down to Port Weller because it's a beautiful area. We parked our boat on the marina, which is in the canal itself. The whole area is wooded area. It is a walkway. We have, they have a walk path. And it's just beautiful. All the way from Port Weller to GM. It is not deemed any industrial. It's all park. It's walkways, pathways. They put berms up to block the city or any other industries. Um, this city, to me and the council for the last 14 years since I've been out here, the east side is under industrial attack. Everything on the east side is industrial. I'm going to explain what Niagara-on-the-Lake did. So what we did back then in the 90s, we got on the bandwagon. You know what? The waterways is moneymaker. It, why pollute it when we can make money off of it? So the jet ski boats were put in down in Queenston. We had the big tall ships going back and forth to Toronto. They revitalized that whole canal system from Port Weller to GM. Just gorgeous. And I please go down there and take a walk because it'll prove my point what this town could be. Been to Cleveland in the last 10 years? Cleveland is a classic example of what exact water and property that gets swamped in and you know, water rises, whatever. They built a beautiful conservation area uh, right, off, right off the canal. Now, the problem is you said that this canal, the, the, it's owned by transport, the federal and whatever. I find that hard to believe that the city of St. Catharines, the town of Niagara-on-the-Lake, uh, Port Robinson, Allenburg, how come they don't have any of these problems? All but Port Colburn has the industrial problem. There's no place else. And they're on the receiving end of us. So anything we build and put in this water is going downstream to them, which I've, I've lived in a lot of areas. This is house number four, and I was hoping to retire here and come into town when I get older and literally live out my days in town here. That's how much of a draw I had 15 years ago. But then what you don't know about me is where my family's from, Walkerton. I'm going to explain to you what actually happened. It wasn't Mr. Cable who was testing the water. It was the farm and the other landowners, industrial landowners. It's very hilly. There's a town called Formosa that lives just outside of Walkerton. They have a water supply that's unlimited. They shut down the water bottle, the people that came in to bottle water. Why? Because their water meant that much to them. Now, Walkerton, what they did is the farmers and the industrial took out the, the wishing wells, there, there's a reason why a wishing well's there. And if you really pay attention, once you get past Guelph, you'll see stone berms on the hillsides. And you think to yourself, what are they for? It's to spread the water away from open water tables. What happened was 
they, the kids, you know, listen to the parents, they decided to put the cows up top and let that water drain down below. Well, the, the cows should have been down below, not up top. I'm a huge advocate when it comes to water. You want to put heavy industrial. Now, back in 2010, did you not have a diesel problem, leakage into your water and went into the water system? That's a, that's a precursor to what could happen. Now, when we drive past Hamilton, I think everybody, nobody wants to go there. Um, it smells. You know, you go over that Burlington Bridge and you look down and you think, what on earth? I would like to see this town, you say that nothing's been done. Well, the city planner, I don't know where he went, but the city planners in the last 14 years, I have never heard once about bringing in industry, light industry, which would be tour boats, a marina over there, conservation area. Down in Niagara Lake, we have tons of that right off the canal. And it's walkable, it's accessible, it's non-toxic. I'm sure there was industries back in the day along there but we've revitalized it. Chippewa, anybody been to the creek in the last five years, what we've done down there? My, my parents still live in Chippewa and all my friends are there. They revitalized, they didn't allow any more industry. Somehow they talked to whoever owns that property, the city. Oh, camera. Be careful. <laughs> Herma. But anyway, they revitalized that creek on both sides to make it accessible. Extra docks went in to park boats. You want to know something? They actually made business. They, the businesses made money, not the city. When you say you want to bring industrial, to me, the city is making money. That's it. It's an income for the city itself. I don't see where building any industrial, light industrial, heavy industrial over there is going to bring any income to the businesses in town of Port Coburn. It would be really nice if you set it up like Niagara Lake. Now, Shirkston Shores, sadly enough, is a contained entity that gives nothing to the city of Port Coburn except taxes. You don't get any of their business because they got all the industry inside of it. They don't come out. They just stay in there. Now, sadly enough, we don't have that industry in Port which we need. To me, industrial is old world thinking. And it belongs to people who, no offense, that are old. But when you get to the younger generation, we're into conservation, tourism. You go to the, the south shore of Lake Erie, and you're going to find the tourist industry is booming over there. Docks, marinas, conservation areas. That's what people want now. They don't want to go to a city and go stay in a motel. They want parks. This town has the opportunity to build something incredible. The east side has been hammered. And from what I read from Environment in Canada in the last couple of days over this, Inco, the nickel, it's still leaching. And just because it sits above the canal, it's no guarantee what goes in there, like you said, the federal. Well, I'm sure if they try, you're going to get a whole more bunch of us fighting them. You know, and that's what the Supreme Court's all about. You know, it, we'll take it everywhere which way we can take it. But in our eyes, we got to stop with this industrial stuff. Look the other way. Like, look at Niagara Lake and St. Catharines. Look at Chippewa. If they're making money for their, own, their business owners, I think that's far more worth value. One minute. Hmm? One, minute? One minute? Well, I think I've said it all. Point of the being is I'm calling you guys out on this. When you say you can't, oh, yes, you can. Turn this city into something. We need to move forward, and we need to think about the future and what our children are going to do. How many kids are sticking around when they grow up? They don't. Chippewa has 600 homes being built, 700 homes being built next to the arena. Come on, Port Coburn, we got to catch up. Thank and you, that Maureen. means tourists. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our fourth delegation is Keith Barr, 201 Mitchell Street. Oh, okay, so Keith Barr is off the list. Okay, anybody else? Mark 
Art. Yeah. No, Art, come on up to the speaker, please. State your name and address. I'm Art Stead, uh, 5 Maple Street, Port Coburn. And uh, I want to congratulate those who are up. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate a little bit and reinforce uh, what they've already had to say. To me, this is a huge step backwards to zone the east side of the canal, industrial or light industrial. There's absolutely no reason for it, particularly since it's already been zoned as parks and open spaces. I have before me here a zoning air zoning. I believe this is official. And the date is on the 23rd of April, 1918, in which uh, signed by the, the, uh, the mayor, John Maloney, in which uh, this sets it up as parks and open space. We know what's going to happen with industrial. And I understand from what's been said by council here, or some members of council, that you've pretty well got a majority already in order for it to eliminate the high uh, industrial. But we'll have to work on them for to get rid of the, the light industrial as well. I have just a few basic concerns. To me, it's a drinking water. We'll start off with. I understand that there's the province or the city. They've on a plan. They said that you can't build anything that'll affect the the drinking water within a certain area of the intake. Well, you can put a line on on any map that you want. The water's going to go where it wants to, and we're going to get mm -hmm. the pollution. Also, everybody is, well, I've been here since 1969, so also uh, all the residents in the area know very well what the dust problem is. There's no doubt about that. And the restaurants will still tell you that every time they go to serve someone, they've got to wipe off the plates and from the dust, and they've got to constantly wipe the tables off because of the dust. That, that's not good, very good at all. And um, so we have to take that into consideration what's going over there. The, la the last thing that I want to discuss, and which is more dear to my heart, which all of it is, is that once we lose park and open space areas, we will never get them back. Okay. I worked here for the city for almost 26 years as a director of parks and recreation, and I did what I could in order for it to get development in parks and open areas. Anything that's ever been taken away has never been returned. But if we lose that parks and open space area there, you can darn well be assured that no one's going to come forth and give it back to us as a city. And if you take a ride down, as I did yesterday, down along the east side of the canal, there's lots of room for improvement. Aesthetically, I would encourage every one of you to, to drive down in that area. And just take, imagine what we can do with some nice green open spaces, some trees and shrubs and flowers and walkways. This, we can do it an awful lot to improve that area. So aesthetically, we must always take a look at what we can do to improve. People often tell me with the beautiful parks that we've got in, in Port Coburn, well, that could be another beautiful park area in Port Coburn. And I agree with what the others is, uh, indicate that uh, 
we really shouldn't be losing it to industrial or late industrial in any way whatsoever. So I would encourage council not to make any decision tonight. Um, it looks like there's enough objections. Uh, uh, there's enough for a vote to object to any heavy industrial, but we got to also take a look at light industrial. And that lady is right about what happens regardless. Once it's zoned, and somebody, and I stand corrected, but once it's zoned and a business wants to come in, I don't think city council has much choice as long as it complies. And then what happens with checking this out on a regular basis, testing materials that are being uh, put out by, by this industries? They say, well, we'll do what we can when it happens. Well, it doesn't happen. In the meantime, I'm drinking the water. You're drinking the water. And we have to put up with it. And nobody seems to be doing anything about it. As a matter of fact, when we talk, when we take a look at this, we're going backwards and a fought long way backwards. And the only objection I have to what that lady says, the older people don't worry about it. Well, I'm 83, so, but I do worry about it. Okay. Thanks, Art. So I will be there at future meetings, and I hope that I get the notice, and uh, I hope that uh, we can get more people out to uh, make sure that uh, this zoning doesn't take place. Thank you. So, Councillor Demeray, with some direction to staff, can, we, can you uh, make a motion that we can vote to give direction to staff in regards to what you spoke about earlier? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I will do that. Um, just forget what my notes were. So, the staff direction would be to separate the dwarf metal piece out from the process and create two separate processes, um, and to. Um, allow the other lands other than door metals to come forward uh, to be actually be tabled for the time being to give Councillor Beauregard and I a chance to have some public meetings and uh, get a, a, some fair comments and from the do, do you need can you give us a timeline on that like do you want to go three months okay um, actually six months or how I far don't do you want have to... confirmation yet from the hall but it's looking like a June 6th meeting Thursday June 6th in so do the you want evening. to go out Three to six months, or uh, okay, that, that would be ideal. Lots of time? Yeah. yeah, that would be ideal. That gives us lots of time to get a lot of comp uh, a, a lot of uh, consultations done, and to make sure so that we is, get to. Is three comment. fine? Three is fine. Yes. So. Evan, is that uh, okay for you, or do you want it longer? Does that work for you? <coughs> so, three within three months, you would have public. You'd have your your public meeting. Yes, we would, we would gather all direction. the comments and bring them to you. Okay. And then you would take those and, and let us know where, where we're going from there. Okay, Th yeah, three to four months would, that good? would, would do it. Yeah. Oh, we'll do four then if we said okay. four. Of course, we'll do that's four. That's fine. Okay. Yep. All right. That works. Good. And then taking the heavy out. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take, taking the heavy out completely, I would hope. Um, and we've entertained the other, just, I want to hear what the public says about that though. Um, and definitely finding a way to, uh, take the medical marijuana and the adult entertainment off the table as well. So um, that would be good. Good. That? Yeah. Thanks, Councillor. So, okay, that's, that that's it. Yeah, uh, Evan, just to. Bye, please. Thank you. Evan, um, with regards to site specific uses, you can pare that down based on uh, what the two councillors will bring forward uh, back to you during this process. As, as Councillor says, you know, with regards to medical marijuana, adults, are, you can start pairing those off? Uh, absolutely. I, I guess the, the question for, uh, for some clarification is, is for the actual Dwar property. If we're separating that from the, from the remainders, uh, or sorry, from the, from the remaining properties, uh, are there specific uses that you'd prefer not to see on the light industrial zone? For the Dwar property at 170 Wallen Street. Take those two out. Yes, if I can, it would be those two as well. Okay. Uh, and otherwise, I would be fine with that just okay. uh, to allow him to go forward. Okay. okay. All right. 
Yes, thank you. So the motion that Councillor Demray moved uh, would be to separate the Dora Metals property uh, and go forward with that with the removal of marijuana adult entertainment as a use uh, and then table the remainder properties for four months and remove the heavy industrial from that uh, those locations and remove the uses of marijuana and adult entertainment as well. Okay. But Evan, that's not to say further uses could come back to you from consultations? In order for you to bring back, correct? No, absolutely. So, Good. so the recommendation report would be based on the feedback that we receive from uh, the public meeting hosted by Councillors uh, Beauregard and Demeray. Demeray, okay. Councillor? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I knew that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I got a mover and a seconder. Any questions to that from Council? Yep. Just for clarification for everyone, when you. Uh, when we're not counting door metals, is is this counting as the door metals properties public meeting and door metals is coming back for the rezoning separately? Councillor, I think that's what Councillor Demery asked. That is what I was thinking, okay. yes. Okay. All right. No further questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Okay. So item. Uh, announcement respecting written notice. You asking oh. Should we find out oh, where okay. the Doors property is? Uh -oh. oh, sure. Uh, if you want to pull that up, Evan. Uh, yeah, so uh, through you, Your Worship, to members of the public, the Door property is the one outlined in uh, in blue. Can you on, bring that map up? On the map, I, if whoever has the mouse. Yeah. Please and thank you. Uh, well, if, if you just go back to the map that was there and just zoom in. Uh, a little further up? No. Right there. This starts at Lewis Street? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And your amendment is to do what? Yep, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. What I've asked to do is move forward with the rezoning of that property to allow Mr. Dwarf to sell his property. That's what he wants to do with that, is to be able to sell it. He does own it. He has that right. Uh, so we're, we're going to go forward and do that, have, keep that as left light industrial. Everything else is going back for consideration. Is there a way to stop it from becoming light industrial? Um, well, if council wanted to do that, uh, they certainly could, but otherwise, no. But I think it's important to understand that this, this gentleman owns this property. Um, and he should have the right to be able to sell it. There will still be site plan control when someone does buy it. They can't just put anything there. They will have to uh, work with staff to be able to find something that, that a use that we can all live with. But it'll be like industrial. Yes, but that sure. can be, you know, that can certainly be, as you see, it can be some really nice things. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, a machine shop. Part of the residential yeah, it, it is. It's always been there. It's been a scrapyard before this, so. I think it's an improvement is what we're looking at. Yeah. So how do we start oh, oh. Okay, well, yeah. You've, um, got to, you've got to come up top. You've got to come up top, present your name and, and address for me. Thanks. Okay, and possibly I wouldn't be the right person to, to talk about no, that. No, that Evan do that. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Councillor. Name and address, please. Yeah, my name's Glenn Hamilton, and I'm at uh, 217 Welland Street. Mm -hmm. So I'm just... Uh, I guess I'm about three doors down from uh, what is it, uh, Lewis Street, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to see that light industrial. So how do I appeal to the OMB to stop it? So I, you can answer that. So it's pretty worship to the delegate, and I guess to anybody else who's a little bit. Because everybody here, I think, was talking Sorry. about. Yeah, let him answer. Let him answer. Thanks. So if anybody has concerns about this, I'll try to explain where we're at. There was an official plan, stop me when I'm wrong, Director of Planning, but uh, there was an official plan that was approved by City Council. That's the document that was referred to under Mayor Maloney's term of council. Mr. DeWar's property is an existing property with existing uses. It's a business that he's running right now. I don't know if you've driven by it and seen it, it exists. As the mayor alluded to earlier tonight, Mr. Dwar became aware of changes that the city made to his property without 
consulting him directly. Now, we consulted the community and we did advertising in the newspaper and on our website that said there's changes coming, but he was never directly consulting. So he approached, I think it's fair to say, he approached council, the mayor, and said, how could you do this without telling me? So I guess I'm asking you to imagine what if you woke up one day and your property had changes on what could be built there, you might understandably be a little bit concerned about that and possibly angry. So what was before you tonight, what is before council tonight is a public meeting to consider changing it back to what it once was. This isn't a new use that's envisioned, it's only to change it back. This is not the decision. This is the time for public input. The decision will come after all of the public input tonight, which includes written and verbal comments, like you're making verbal comments right now. The planning staff will write a report to council and that's the day that they'll make a final decision. And they could decide not to change it back to what it once was or to allow the change. At that time when a decision is made, you could appeal it to what used to be called the OMB. So you might say, if council decides to change it back, you might come in and we'll teach you how, make an appeal to the OMB, or council might say, you know what, we're gonna listen to the comments that were made and we're gonna make a decision to leave it as park and open space. And the owner of the property, Mr. Dwar, or someone he sold it to, might say that they're going to appeal it to the planning board. So this is not the decision day. This is a chance for you to tell council what you want them to do. And other people can come up too, as some have already. So I would suggest that now is an opportunity for you to say to council what you want to have happen. And when you're done, we'll let, sign those sheets that are on the back table, the tables all the way in that back room where there's some people gathered. And we'll inform you when it's back on the agenda. We'll inform all of you when it's back on the agenda. And at that time, you can come and observe the decision being made and make a decision on if you want to appeal it. Does that provide a little bit of clarity? Uh, sure, but I'd like to, um, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate what happened to that gentleman that owned the property to, um, you know, he missed the notices. I guess he missed the meetings. He missed all the, you know, everything you tried to do to inform him. I don't know, maybe he was out of the country or something like that. I mean, yeah, I feel for that gentleman, but um, still, like when I bought that property there, I felt with the Nickel Beach and everything, I thought, this is a great retirement community for people. You know, that's the best beach on Lake Erie. So, three or none. <laughs> three so, or three, probably not the person you should be speaking to. I'm just trying to clarify the process for you. You are right that we did uh, a very public process, yeah. and I can't explain why that person didn't avail themselves of the public per, uh, process. I can't explain that. And now here we are sitting in a new public process. So I'm just a guy who sits up here. I don't get to make any decisions. <laughs> and you have to influence the nine voters yeah. around the table, sure. the nine council well, members. Well, I would say that nightmare that that guy had, yeah. the rest of us don't yeah. want that same nightmare. That's fair to say. And that's why we're all here. Sure. To end the nightmare. <laughs> and I understand he wants, that gentleman wants 400000 for that property. I think that's what I heard. There's a star right here. Okay, let's not. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. That stick, would, stick to this, please. Let's not talk about that stuff. That's. Well, that he's. That's. Oh, I thought that was a property owner. Well, anyway, I'm just, I'm just thinking that uh, there must be another way to stop industry from going there because the depth of that property is really only a sufficient buffer zone, we'll call it, for the existing industry. And I don't really understand why it wasn't made into a park. Why didn't the city make these lands into parks when they were zoned to be parks? The city doesn't own them. Oh, the city so doesn't own any of these. So well, a little piece down at the end. Oh, I see. So who would end up making them parks? Well, to be quite honest, probably nobody because the federal government may turn it into a, what they want to use it for, whatever that could be. 
So does it then fall on the city's? No, no. No. Okay, well, so I guess I'd just say that when I bought that property, there was nothing going on on that property there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there was a big industry going on there, I wouldn't have bought the property. So, okay. So if, if it does turn back into that, then I'll probably sell my property, you know? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> if I could, if I could. But if I couldn't, then what happens then if I couldn't sell my property? No, I, that, I, that I can't answer. I'm not a real estate agent. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I guess I go broke. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, I'm here to, to help stop this industrialization of this beautiful beach area. I call that the Nickel Beach community. Okay, thank nice. you. Okay, so Evan, you have the uh, announcement respecting written notice portion. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a second last item on our list here is that uh, announcement respecting written notice of passage of the zoning bylaw amendment. If you wish to be notified of the approval of the zoning bylaw and official plan amendment, you must make a written request to the clerk. Only those persons and public bodies that give the clerk a written request for the notice of adoption and passing of a zoning bylaw amendment will be given notice. As previously stated, there is a sign-in sheet at the back of the uh, room and also any person that has already submitted a written comment and provided an address, uh, they will be receiving. Uh, notice of future meetings and notice of decision. Uh, and finally, explanation of uh, future meetings. Uh, so this concludes the public hearing under the Planning Act. Well, just before you do that, uh, yeah, sorry. because uh, Mr. Hamilton was the last one that had his hand up, is there anybody else just before we go? Yes. Name and address, please. Yep. Hello. My name is George Inouye Beaulieu. I'm getting more confused. This is about my seventh meeting I come to this, you guys. You guys want to have heavy industrial in that area? You want to put that little park thing that you got? No, that's been taken off the table by the councilor. Okay. When you guys come up and you guys put your proposal up, they say heavy industrial. Well. What are you going to put in there? Nobody knows. I don't know. But you're, and you guys don't know. Vote on it, turn it into a heavy industrial or light industrial. For a what? And if these guys think about which way the wind blows northwest, southwest, blows right, right across the canal. If you guys are going to build a heavy industrial, and the dust and whatever, it's gonna go right on those, <coughs> these little houses up there. That's pollution. Yeah, but as I said, the counselor t took that took off, that off so you know, took that off the table, yes. Okay, but could we, whoever wants to bring any other opinion, heavy industrial, of what? Have it on paper so we understand what the heck it is. And another thing, when you guys had those kids sing on the camera, O Canada, I want you guys to vote in to have them for hockey games at the Bell Center. That was good. Yeah, they were good. Yeah. That was good. That's McKay School. They're good. Yeah. Yeah, have them. Yeah. Why not? That's up to the, the, the team that's there. No, no, no. That's you guys, man. No, no, that's not. No, no, that's you guys. That's the junior team. That was me. <laughs> good. Thanks. Thanks. That's good. Okay. Counselor. Just wondering for the benefit of the people in here, um, when we talk about the door lines, Evan, could you explain to the public, um, let's say going right from the Clarence Street Bridge due south out into the mouth of the lake, how much of that from the canal front, because it speaks to the point, of, I think, in, indirectly of the lady from Chippewa, how much of the land from the wall of the canal in 
is not part of this. In other words, I understand that there is a, the complete canal front is owned and retained by the seaway up to so many feet in. And then it's from that point to Welland Street for which we're dealing with, if that's correct. Yeah, so uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, to Councillor Bruno. Um, so the Transport, Transport Canada and the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation um, are retaining at least 100 feet uh, along the canal throughout Niagara. Uh, in this area, I'm going to say that it would be might be in excess of, of 30 feet. I don't have the exact measurements in front of me. I, I can provide those in, the, in, a, uh, in a future report. Um, and then, so, th so that's, can't be contemplated. That is, that is Transport Canada, that is sacrosanct. It, it, it cannot be. Uh, 100 meters, don't you mean, mean 100 meters? I thought it was 300. Sorry, yeah, three, no, you're right, you're right, 100 meters, 100 meters. Um, 330 feet. Yeah, three, yeah, my apologies. Uh, the uh, so then the actual private owned property, uh, both the Dwar property and then also the Transport Canada land to the south of the, the Dwar property, uh, they're kind of trapezoid shaped. The actual depth varies, but I'm going to say the average is probably in the um, 60, 60 meter range. Kager, thank you. Good, thanks, Councilor. Okay. No, you, one speaker at a time. Thanks. Okay. So you finished with what you have. So uh, explanation of future meetings. Uh, so this concludes the public meeting uh, under the public hearing under the Planning Act. Uh, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment will be placed on council's agenda at a future meeting. Oh, sorry, the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment will be placed on council's agenda at a future meeting. Um, we have some time frames established through Councillor Demeray and Councillor Beauregard's um, public meetings that staff will gladly provide any materials or any other assistance required. And then we also have direction that we will be coming back with a separate recommendation report dealing with just with 170 Welland Street, which we've been referring to as the Dwar property. Okay. Okay, Council, so the recommendation is that public hearing report 2019-64 regarding application for official plan amendment filed DO 901-19 and zoning bylaw amendment filed D14039-19 be received for information. Mover and seconder, Councilor Demery, Councilor Bagu, questions on that? All those in favor? That's carried. And before we adjourn, you do have the uh, two ward councillors that will host minimum of one meeting, I'm sure it could be more. Um, uh, approximately June 6th. Um, keep an eye out for that with them. Okay, motion to adjourn this portion of the public meeting. Councillor um, Danch, Councillor Beauregard, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So we're now moving into public meeting report of zoning bylaw amendment D1402 one nine forty five dash fifty three West Side Road, Evan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So uh, this is a public meeting for, as stated, forty five dash fifty three West Side Road, um, known as the No Frills Plaza or uh, Treasure Hunt Plaza, uh, what you will. Uh, so the. The purpose of the meeting is pursuant to Section 34 of the Planning Act uh, is to consider an application initiated by the agent John Redekop for the owner Terry St. Amand for the property legally known as Block A on Plan 69-NP828 in the City of Port Colborne, Regional Municipality of Niagara, municipally known as 45-53 West Side Road. The application for zoning bylaw amendment proposes to change the zoning from commercial plaza to CP-50, which is a special provision adding a motor vehicle gas station and a car wash as permitted uses to the property. Uh, method of notice, notice of public meeting was administered in accordance with section 34 of the Planning Act as amended in section five of Ontario Regulation 545-06. 
Notice of public meeting was circulated to required agencies and property owners within 120 meters of the property on April 18th, 2019. Um, public notice signs were posted on the properties by April 23rd, 2019 and a uh, public notice was also posted on the city's website on April 18th, 2019. Staff hosted a public open house on April 30th, 2019. Uh, no members of the public attended the meeting um, except for the, uh, the property owner. Uh, so explanation of procedure to be followed. The plan, uh, procedure to be followed this evening is be, will be to present, present Development of Planning and Development, uh, sorry, Department of Planning and Development Report 2019-66. Hear any comments from the applicant, receive questions of clarification from Council to the applicant or planning staff, open the meeting to the public for comments and questions, announce the requirements under the Planning Act for written notice of passage for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and a brief explanation of future meetings regarding the application. So at this time, I would like to present uh, Planning and Development Public Hearing Report 2019-66. Thank you. Uh, so the location and context, uh, this property is located at the southwest corner of West Side Road and Highway 3. Oops, sorry, Main, Main Street West, formerly Highway 3. Uh, Regional Road 3. Um, the, uh, it's presently occupied by a, uh, by a commercial plaza with a grocery store um, and department stores and a pet store. Uh, the uh, surrounding land uses include commercial um, on the opposite side of Main Street West, on the uh, north side of Main Street West, and then institutional and park on the east side of West Side Road and a park and residential areas to the south and southwest um, of the property. Okay, so the uh, current official plan designation, and I've highlighted the, the property in, in red there, uh, the City of Port Colborne's official plan designates the property as Commercial Plaza. Land uses in the Commercial Plaza designation include retail stores, offices, restaurants, service businesses, movie theaters, and places of amusement or recreation. Uh, City of Port Colborne zoning bylaw 6575-30-18. The subject property is zoned Commercial Plaza. Commercial Plaza zone permits uh, a variety of commercial uses. Uh, it does not permit a car wash, and it only permits existing motor vehicle gas stations. Um, thus the need for the application to permit a new motor vehicle gas station and a car wash. Uh, the applicant is also seeking, uh, well, so where are we here? The uh, special provisions are also going to be required um, to, uh, to reduce the corner side yard setback, reduce parking requirements, and minimum landscape area on the property uh, to permit the structures to be built um, in the say the uh, the northeast corner of the property um, and again these changes are being sought to build a motor vehicle gas station a car wash and two new commercial structures on this property the uh, purpose of the application uh, it's as stated several times now to build a motor vehicle gas station car wash in addition additional commercial uses on the pro units on the property uh, and the zoning changes are required to add the new uses and to reduce the setbacks and parking requirements for the new buildings. Um, public comments. Uh, we have received uh, one public comment, or sorry, one comment from a member of the public, uh, Ritesh Malik, who is the owner of 599 Main Street West, which is the uh, gas station and A&W that is being built across the road um, presently. Uh, so Mr. Malik has concerns about uh, lower growth rate in Port Colborne and the ability of the community to absorb new commercial uses. Uh, concerns about potential uh, competition from the new gas station across the street, um, from his gas station that is currently being built uh, and his expensive construction costs. Uh, he certainly had some issues with rock on the site. They have reduced the profitability and expanded the, uh, the um, well, the, the horizon for return on investment for <coughs> Mr. Malik. Um, he's also expressing concerns about competing businesses in close proximity will make 
further commercial developments at 599 Main Street West difficult, and he is strongly opposed to the zoning bylaw amendment. And uh, just to clarify, his comment came in at, um, I'm going to say 3.30 today, uh, and so I haven't had a chance to circulate it to Council, but it will be available in full in the future recommendation report. Um, city and agency comments. Uh, drainage superintendent for the City of Port Colborne has no concern, and the regional municipality of Niagara is not opposed to this application. Uh, and so now we're in the comments of the applicant uh, section of the meeting. So at this time, Your Worship, I'd like to invite the applicant to comment. Uh, both the applicant and uh, his agent are here, so they can uh, attend if needed, if they desire. Come on up. It's not on there? Okay. Okay. Your Worship, members of Council, and staff. I'll be very brief this evening as you have a long evening still ahead of you. And unfortunately, we don't have our site plan um, up on the screen so that it illustrates. I'm not sure if you've seen our site plan with the package that the staff would have given to you. But I'll just state your name first. Sorry. Michael Allen of ACK Architects. I represent uh, Mr. St. Amon, the owner of the property. As you're all aware, the current site, an eight-acre site, is currently underutilized and not developed properly for the potential of that area. It is a key intersection for the City of Port Colborne. And what we're proposing to uh, improve or add the uses to the site for the uh, car wash and the gas station, we feel are compatible for the existing commercial uses on the site. The additional restaurants and coffee shops are just all part of the design with it. Now, with our request to... Um, ask for uh, consideration to the side yard setback. The current building itself is already at a 12 meter setback to the west side road. So we're not asking for extensive relief. It allows us to also go part and parcel with the landscape coverage. Now currently, um, the site has no landscaping um, with it. So our proposal is actually adding a landscaping to the site, although the bylaws request the, the 10%. Our 8% will be a great improvement to what's currently not there with it. The parking itself, when you look at it, and no disrespect to the city of Port Colborne, but your parking um, standards in your bylaw are antiquated. Um, they're not up to the times with, with the urban development that is currently even going on in your town. If you compare to the um, other municipalities that surround you, such as Niagara Falls and St. Catharines, if you use their parking standards based on the commercial plaza, as well as the proposed uses that we're putting in there, we would only require 254 parking spaces on that site. There is, is, there is, for that specific site and all the developments around it, there's a synergy of shared parking that would go on. So instead of having all the asphalt and, and currently that's there, we feel the addition to the commercial uses, the businesses, as well as the improved site for landscaping would, would be a great addition to, uh, to that property. So with that, we, we certainly respect your consideration for our application and we'll address any questions and comments you may have. Thank you. Questions? Council? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Oh, sir, yes, Councilor. Just knowing the area and stuff like that, would you guys be looking for another entrance onto West Side Road or Highway Three, or would you just utilize the entrances that you have now? So through your your worship, if you looked at the site plan that we submitted with the application, we're utilizing the existing entrances that are on the property. We are requesting for one more access to the property um, just past the existing entrance. It will only be a right-in access, which will give direct access into the service or gas station as opposed to having loop all the way around. It will actually relieve congestion to the actual intersection. So we're not looking for a, um, a complete two-way in-and-out access. It'll just be a direct right-in. Okay, Councillor? Okay. Okay, Councillor? Good. Thank you for Thank your time. You. Okay, and now um, questions of clarification to planning staff or the applicant from council. Um, so if there's anything to staff, council? Okay, seeing none. Okay, now uh, before we open the meeting to the public, I'd like to read the following. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Port Colborne before a decision on a proposed zoning bylaw amendment is passed by Council, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the City of Port Colborne Council to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal. 
if a person or a public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Port Colborne before a decision on the proposed zoning bylaw amendments is passed by Council, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there is reasonable grounds to do so. Uh, and any interested members of the public, I, if I might draw your attention to the back of the room, there is a sign-in sheet uh, available um, for this specific application uh, should you request future notices regarding this application. And so now at this time, Your Worship, I'd like to invite members of the public who wish to speak to the, uh, to the application to do so. Okay, thank you. Anybody wish to speak on this application? Okay, seeing none, Evan? Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so now an announcement re respecting written notice of passage of the zoning bylaw amendment. If you wish to be notified of the approval of the zoning bylaw amendment, you must make a written request to the clerk. Only those persons and public bodies that give the clerk a written request to the, for the notice of the adoption and passing of the zoning bylaw amendment will be given notice. Uh, now, explanation of future meetings. Uh, this concludes the public hearing report under the Planning Act. Um, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment will be placed on Council's agenda at a future meeting. Okay. You're all set? I'm, I'm good. Thank you. So we have a recommendation, and that is that public hearing report number 2019-66 regarding application for zoning bylaw amendment file number D140219 for 43-54 Westside Road be received as information. A mover and a seconder. Councillor Wells, Councillor Bruno, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Motion to adjourn this public meeting. Mover, Councillor Danch, Councillor Bodner. Questions? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you, members of council, and thank you to the public. We are now moving into our uh, Monday, the May 13th, uh, special meeting of council. Uh, the agenda is, we'll call this meeting to order. Introduction of addendum and delegation items. Madam Clerk. Uh, there's one addendum item this evening. Uh, item number one, regarding who stock will be removed from the agenda. It's been withdrawn at the department's request. Okay, thank you. Confirmation of the agenda, moving a seconder. Councilor Beauregard, Councilor Bodner, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Any disclosures of interest with any items this evening? We have uh, three minutes to adopt the regular meeting of Committee of the Whole 12-19 held on April the 23rd, 2019. Special meeting of Committee of the Whole 13-19 held on April 30th, 2019. Special Committee of the Whole 14-19 held on May 6th and May 7th, 2019. A mover and a seconder for these. Councillor Wells, Councillor Demeray, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. Councillors, and item one's off the table. Councillor Bodner. Item eight, Mr. Mayor. Item eight. Councillor Clayliff, anything? Which item? Um, item number nine. Item number nine. <coughs> Councilor Danch, anything? Councilor Beauregard. Item 13. Item 13. Bruno? Item six, Your Worship. Item six. Councilor Baggia? Item 14, Your Worship. Councillor Demeray. Okay, Councillor Wells, thank you. Approval of those items not requiring separate discussion, a mover and a seconder. Councillor Bruno, Councillor Bagu, any questions? All those in favor? Those are carried. Presentations. Our presentation this evening is from John Greer, Executive Director of the OSPCA, and Amanda Ellis, CCTBS Enforcement. Manager OSPCA, 
of the Welland District SPCA regarding SPCA rule changes. Come on up front. Uh, Your Worship, Councillors, thank you very much for having us this evening. Uh, we have a slight presentation uh, just to show you some of the things that the Welland District SBCA are up to. Uh, and then we had Council uh, may have some questions about the changes to the upcoming Ontario SBCA Act. So we'll quickly go through our presentation and then give you lots of chance for, uh, to ask us some questions. So some background information. The Welland District SBCA has existed since 1954. Uh, in 2018, we have amalgamated with the Niagara Falls Humane Society, and we have now formed a Niagara SPCA and Humane Society. And you'll see from the map, the blue is us. That's the service area that we now represent uh, throughout uh, the region. And what's not on there is Haldeman County. We also do Haldeman County. So we have quite a large service area. Uh, some of the things that we are very proud of is our veterinary clinic. It opened in 2014. Uh, it's going very well. We're booked about four months. We do low-cost spay-neuter. We do vaccines for people that can't afford to go to regular veterinary services and do that. Uh, and we're a fully certified companion animal clinic. Uh, this is something that we established in 2015. Currently, it's the only mobile spay-neuter clinic in the entire province. Uh, we roll it out. We go through uh, First Nations communities. We've done one in the No Frills parking lot here in Port Colburn. We can set up. It's a full surgery hospital and we can offer the same services as our stationary clinic but we can bring it literally into a parking lot now and provide those services for our communities. Uh, and this is just a few of the pictures of inside the mobile and the mobile itself. Uh, we've completed, that number's a little higher now, but 1,574 spay-neuter procedures. We do wellness exams as well, so we do full rabies vaccines, deworming for the community members as well, all of course at a reduced cost so that they can afford it. And I'll let Amanda Alice, our enforcement manager, take over from here. So this is our humane education program which I head up with actually my dog and I go into a lot of schools, uh, senior residences and I do education. I also provide training on dog bite prevention training for any uh, officers through municipal bylaw or Ministry of Natural Resources, as well as our own officers on dog bite prevention. So it's an education program that we've established. Uh, and this is something, again, of course, we provide the City of Port Colburn with is your animal control contract. Uh, we have training throughout the year. We also have a building over on East Main Street that we provide all kinds of training against for uh, any of our community partners. Uh, we do use of force training exercises. Uh, bite prevention, anything like that, and of course all of the communities that we work with, especially the bylaw departments, we include them. We're currently working with the City of Port Colburn to implement the AMPS program, uh, and of course it'll be cost sharing because we do serve nine out of the 12 municipalities in the Niagara region, so there'll be a cost sharing for all of the municipalities that are involved in that. Uh, this will probably come more towards the end. It's our cruelty investigations, which is on June the 28th, is, will be ending. Uh, but uh, like I say, we can answer those questions more towards the end of it. Uh, our services will continue exactly to all of our communities. Our officers will still attend all of the calls. Uh, right now, it r basically rests with the provincial government to decide who will carry on when it hits the legislative part. So both Amanda and I are Ontario SBC inspectors as well. Uh, so, like I say, our officers are still going to respond exactly to the municipalities uh, and once we decide it looks like probably your regular type cruelty will fall into the policing, OMOF will do your farm animals, the Ministry of Natural Resources will do the wildlife. Uh, and we did do a hand out there, we will have a support service where we will still assist police or other enforcement agencies uh, forensically with uh, forensic evidence, of course with sheltering because they won't have sheltering. And it's kind of a process right now that really sits back with the provincial government on and, and June 28th and hopefully we'll all kind of know exactly what, uh, what direction the government's going in. 
this is uh, another program that we've developed as our multimedia department. We're quite proud of it. We do a lot of in-house production. We have our own YouTube channel. We do a lot of that. We try to stay ahead of the social network, stay relevant within the communities, of course, that we serve. Uh, and we, you know, we do the Northern Animal Summit, so we do. A, we work with OPP. We do a lot of different work uh, through the multimedia. And we'll just quickly give you a little bit of our human resources breakdown. Uh, currently, we have five OSPC agents, two inspectors, five animal patrol officers. We have 14 animal care attendants, three registered veterinary technicians. Uh, and two veterinarians in-house. If you take into our mobile team, we actually have four veterinarians on staff. Uh, and again, within the clinic, three veterinarians, two RVTs, and four support staff. So we have a lot of staff that we can put towards the animal care and control aspect. Uh, quickly, we'll just go through 2018 numbers. Enforcement, that's your bylaw on cruelty, 2,587. Stray dog cat pickup, 977. Wildlife distress, which is either sick, injured, or trapped, 806. We did 1,349 adoptions, and we returned 385 pets to, that were just lost, basically, from their homes. I got that right. Yeah. And that's basically it, Your Worship, counselors, for the uh, for the actual presentation part. We just thought we'd gain we haven't seen you guys for a while and we thought we would come and it's newer council and let you know some of the things that we're up to and see what I, uh, questions you have. Okay. Any questions to John or Amanda? Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you. Um, to either John or Amanda. Um, it, it's good to hear the update, and it's good to hear that there are anticipated changes, but they don't seem to be too earth-shattering, which is that's a, it's a good thing. Uh, and I had asked for, for you to come and, and uh, just touch base with us and let us know what, uh, what was going to be happening. You now, you say on June 28th you'll have a, a far better picture. I, was, I would hope that if there are significant changes, you will come back and update us again. Through your worship, absolutely, Council. Right, yeah, great. and we don't see that because, like I say, uh, we were, we're working very closely with the Ontario SBCA, so I think the fact that we're working on the legislative changes with the, the provincial government and the fact that we'll provide those support services anyway, so it, uh, there's been a lot of media out there that June 28th yeah. cruelty investigations are just ending. That is definitely not the case. Well, that we, is we will still very be on the road hear. responding to calls. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Seeing none? Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mark. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, this may be a little off topic, but uh, we had an incident last week at Park Coleman where a cat was in a tree for four or five days. People called around. They called you guys. They called the fire department. They called City Hall. Nobody gave them any direction. Now, just for information, what, what do people do now? Like you, you don't rescue cats in the trees. The fire, no, the fire department doesn't do it. Through you, you, your okay. worship to the councillor. Uh, no, we don't do tree rescues. We don't have the equipment to do true tree rescues. So we normally, when we get calls like that, uh, we would contact the local fire department and we respond through the fire department. Hopefully, uh, sometimes the tree people that do the, the large tree pruning. Uh, one of the things, unfortunately, as a humane society, people don't understand this is if a cat gets up the tree, it will come down the tree. It, it's mm -hmm. people, I know it, it looks really bad, but cats will come down from the tree if they get up the tree. So we will attempt it. Uh, we would direct people, basically, we would make the call from our dispatch to the local fire department to see if they will assist us, and we would send officers out, basically, for when the cat comes down. But absolutely, our officers are not uh, for these high, really high up places. They're, they're just not equipped for it. Councillor? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. I know the fire department at Park Coleman will not rescue cats in the trees. So basically, probably what we have to do is get a uh, tree surface or a nice guy that's working down the street with a ladder that was siding a house and he, he actually rescued it. So uh, okay. thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, any other questions? Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We have one delegation this evening. Uh, we have George Henry, President, and Dan Tonello, Board Member, Community Living, Port Colborne Wainfleet, regarding Community Living Awareness Month. Gentlemen, welcome. Good 
evening. I'm uh, George Henry. I uh, am president of Community Living in Fort Fulton. And we want to thank your worship uh, and members of council um, for giving us the time to uh, let you know what we're doing um, yeah, around here this year. For almost two years now, um, Community Living in Fort Erie and uh, Community Living in Fort Coburn have shared one executive director, and I have to say one great executive director. Um, and recently the boards of directors um, of the two organizations met and oh, decided... Oh, press your microphone on, George. Thanks. Uh, recently the two boards have uh, got together and decided to explore um, amalgamation of the two organizations. Um, and I emphasize the word explore. Um, it's a two-year ag agreement for the sharing of executive director, and um, we just wanted to see if there was a better way to do it than, than have two separate organizations reporting to um, the government rather than one. We feel that an amalgamated organization would build on the strengths of both. It would offer benefits to people supported, to their families, and to staff. Benefits that would be achieved through efficiencies that come with having one organization rather than two. Initially, the merged organizations would focus on streamlining and increasing administrative capacity. The way that services are currently provided in each community would remain the same for the foreseeable future. Amalgamation is a process that takes time and involves a number of steps. And we only will proceed if those steps are completed and if both boards of directors and the members of the Community Living Fort Erie and Community Living Port Colburn, Wayne Fleet, decide that merging is in the best interest of both organizations. Our organization is dedicated to helping people live quality lives. We work in partnership with organizations and businesses in Port Colburn so people with developmental disabilities are able to live as independently as desired and experience full inclusion in the community. Again, we thank you for having us here tonight, for the city's continued support of our children and youth programs, and we would always like to encourage everyone in Port Colburn to celebrate Community Living Awareness Month by including someone with an intellectual challenge in your community activity and events. And Dan chairs the uh, People Helping People Achieve, the Self-Advocate Council, and I'll let Dan explain what they do. Thank you, George. Your Worship, members of Port Coburn City Council and citizens of Port Coburn, my name is Dan Tonello, a representative of People Helping People Achieve, a self-advocate group supported by Community Living Port Coburn Wayne Fleet. I would like to spend a few moments speaking on the topic of language, of people first language. The words that we choose to use in our conversations can empower, inspire, motivate, and give hope. Words can create or reinforce positive qualities such as unity and inclusion. Language is in a state of flux and over time has continued to evolve. However, there are some archaic expressions that still exist in our common vernacular. Here are some examples of person-first language. A person with a disability, a person with autism, she has a learning disability, a person with an intellectual or developmental disability, a person who communicates without using words. In conclusion, I would like to read this short poem. If you see someone falling behind, walk with them. If you see someone being ignored, find a way to include them. If someone has been knocked down, lift them up. 
always remind people of their worth. One small act could mean the world to them. Ask yourself, what can I do to make a difference in someone's life? Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak to you and for your attention. Thank you, Dan. George, um, any questions from council? No? Um, just like to thank, oh, sorry, Councilor. Mr. Mayor, we've seen uh, Mr. Henry present here a number of times for community living. And um, I, think it, I think we, well, I would like to, and I'm sure other members of the community would like to thank George and his wife, Lil, uh, for just many years of, of working with community living and, and for what they do on a personal, um, um, in their personal life uh, to help people of our community. So, George, thank you very much and say hi to Lil. And amalgamation um, is scary. You, you said it. Uh, I was on the United Way board and we just amalgamated. Um, there's many good things about it. And um, while, you know, after a year or so, you can tell whether it was a good idea or not, it sure seems like a good idea from the United Way. And I'm sure if you're involved, you'll make sure that, uh, that Port Coburn will get uh, everything they deserve in this whole amalgamation thing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bruno? Thank you, Worship. Uh, Councillor Bodner's words couldn't be more true, George. You are just a class act <laughs> inside and outside your organization. Thank you for what you've done. Just a suggestion on um, on the board governance issue, if I might. Um, I've seen where some boards have, when they've amalgamated, they've not used the traditional per capita or the income they bring to the table, but they've actually equalized the voting. So you could perhaps get all the benefits of amalgamation, but not be outvoted or disqualified because of the weighted presence of your board members. Just a thought I wanted to pass on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for Council. that. Um, we're open to any um, people with uh, experience in amalgamations um, because as I say, it's a, it's a long process and we want to make sure that if, if we do it, we do it right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, George and Dan, uh, I'd like to thank you for allowing the city to be involved uh, Friday, May 3rd, we did the flag raising, and you had a good group of staff and a big gang of clientele that came out from Community Living, and they were so proud on the steps of City Hall. We had our banners up, uh, and then we did the flag raising. Uh, my dad sat on your board for many, many years uh, as I was growing up, and my brother-in-law uh, was president for a number of years. Um, so my family's always been engaged with Community Living, so we're a huge supporter. and. Uh, we look forward to you guys having a successful amalgamation. Um, you know, as the councillor said, it can be scary, but um, I think with those two organizations, it could be probably a pretty good uh, product once you guys are finished. So we wish you luck on that. So again, thank you. Thank you for your support. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Dan. Okay, on to the uh, mayor's report. Tomorrow is Test It Tuesday, and we encourage everyone to test your smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors. Anytime you need assistance, please call our fire department at 905-834-4512, and they'll come over and look at your smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors and give you any help that uh, you may need. Do we have the video today? Tuesday, May 14th is Test It Tuesday, and Port Colborne Fire and Emergency Services want to know, are the heroes in your home working? Today we're doing a burn test cell in order to show the effectiveness of smoke alarms and how quickly they will react at the start of a fire within your home. So it gives you ample opportunity to escape your home before the fire becomes too involved or the smoke becomes too heavy for you to be able to breathe to get out. 
How fast, when the fire starts, would the smoke alarm sound? Normally in a normal-sized bedroom or a house or a dining room, you're about 30 to 45 seconds. Because our burn cell is as small as it is, it went off within about the first 10 seconds of the incipient stage fire in the wastebasket near the base of the bed. It's tested Tuesday coming up on May 14th. Another reminder for residents to test their alarms. Why is that so important? Because alarms will fail. They're only good for about 10 years, according to the manufacturer's instructions. And then after that, they need to be replaced. Also, a lot of alarms have batteries in them. If we didn't change them when we changed our clocks, we need to change them now in order to ensure that they're going to work throughout the year until we can change our, our batteries again. They always need to be working, and sometimes they sit there and we don't pay attention to them until there's an emergency. Tim, I think the goal for any fire department would be 100% compliance of working smoke and carbon dioxide in homes. What program has the city implemented to try and make that happen? Uh, so we go door to door and uh, knock on everyone's door that we can. And if you let us in, it'd be great because we were only there for about 10, 15 minutes. It's a quick check just to make sure that your alarm's not expired, that it's working. And if you need help changing the batteries, we change them too. The batteries are free and there's a small charge for the alarms that is cheaper than you buying it at the store. So. And how many people are opening their doors and letting you in? Uh, usually we'll get a few each shift. We'll try and hit 10 every four days. So some let us in, some don't. We'd appreciate it if everybody let us in. We're not there to find. We're just there to help them out. And if you don't make it to a resident's home during your weekly visits, how can they go about getting, making sure that their homes are compliant? They can call us at the department and make an appointment, and uh, we'll come out and check it for you. And we're putting a lot of focus right now on fire, but what about carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide alarms are required in every home and we want them outside of your sleeping area. We want it to wake you up at night in case there's a buildup of carbon monoxide in your home. They should also be tested on a regular basis and with Tested Tuesday, don't be afraid to test them as well. All smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms have a test button feature which makes it make noise and check that it's working. You mentioned carbon monoxide needs to be outside each sleeping area. What about smoke alarms? Where do they need to be in your home? Smoke alarms need to be on every level of your home because we don't know where the fire might start and as, as well as outside of your bedroom. So depending on the configuration of your home, you may have several within it. Never think it can't happen to you. On Tuesday, May 14th, be sure to test your smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. If you need assistance, contact your local fire department. Reporting in Port Colburn, for The Source, Michelle Cuthbert. Great. Good job, staff and Michelle. That was excellent. I did have the fire department. They did our neighborhood about a month ago. And uh, uh, for those that were home, they did a fantastic job. And they did replace one in my house that we paid for and checked our other batteries. I do have some that are, um, there's no batteries once it wears out it. You throw it away and you buy a new one, so or recycle it, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we appreciate what the fire department does on this program. I think it does help to save property and lives, which is the important thing. The Canadian Women's National Sledge Hockey Team will be facing off against Sledge Team Ontario in Port Colburn for a three-game series at the Valet Health and Wellness Center. The City of Port Colburn is proud of their affiliation with both the men's and women's national sledge hockey teams. Residents and visitors are encouraged to participate by coming out and cheering on the athletes, and the admission is free. Games are this uh, Friday, May 17th, and Saturday, May 18th uh, at 7 o'clock, and then Sunday, May the 19th uh, at 10 a.m. on Rink 1 at the Valley Health and Wellness Centre. Our summer season began last week as we welcomed 45 students to our workforce. Students will be working in almost every building and in our parks and marina this summer. Our park season begins this weekend, so if you're looking to book a park or pavilion for an event, please give the city a call. And hopefully the weather will improve so children can start enjoying the Discovery Spray Pad in HH Knoll Lakeview Park uh, on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. And it will be open on weekends uh, only from Saturdays uh, and Sundays until the mid-June when the weather actually gets a lot nicer and we hope we don't need parkas between now and then. Uh, we are all very pleased to announce that Dr. Debbie Wilkes Whitehall has been named Niagara Region's top family physician. Great accolades. She was nominated by Dr. Amanda Bell, 
who is the original assistant dean of the Niagara Regional Campus of the Michael G. DeGroot School of Medicine and Family Physician. Dr. Wilkes Whitehall received her award on Doctor's Day, which was celebrated on May the 1st. Dr. Wilkes Whitehall is an exemplary physician and a strong member of the medical community and mentor to our students. She delivers high quality care to all of her patients, but especially to those who are most vulnerable due to eating disorders, mental health, and addiction issues. She created the Niagara Eating Disorder Outpatient Program, the only provincially funded treatment program in Niagara. Her passion for teaching has seen her grow her role from clinical teacher to a member of the senior leadership of McMaster University's, University's Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine. She also provides care to physicians and their families through the Ontario Medical Association's Physician Help Program. And on behalf of uh, the Mayor's Office and all of City Council and the citizens of Port Coburn, uh, we do a big congratulations to Debbie Wilkes Whitehall. That's a, a great award to win in Niagara. Today we held a press conference at the Valet Centre uh, announcing that the Niagara Ice Dogs and the Barry Colts of the Ontario Hockey League will be facing off in an exhibition game at the Valet Health and Wellness Centre in Port Colborne on Friday, August the 30th of 2019. Revenue from the exhibition game tickets uh, will be going to support the Port Colborne Wave Girls Hockey Association. The girls minor hockey program continues to grow with pl plans to add at least two teams for the upcoming 2019-2020 season. Please mark your calendars now and come out to support local youth. Tickets will be on sale at the Valley Health and Wellness Centre box office. Harry was there today, so we had Bones and uh, Bill and Diana um, Burke, the owners of the Ice Dogs, came down for the announcement, as well as the media and, and several people from the public came into uh, the Golden Puck Room. So it was a great announcement for Port Colborne. The last time we held the Ice Dogs here was at a practice, and it was the year that... Um, St. Louis captain Petrangelo was drafted into the NHL, so that's how far back it goes, and it was at the old West Side Arena. So we did an open practice and then an open skate with our kids in town and, and, uh, and parents. So it's good to see that they're going to come in, and I'm sure we'll fill the rink once again like we did for the Canada-USA sledge hockey game, and again, hopefully this weekend with, that, uh, with our support for our Team Canada's. Uh, for the Niagara Regional Police... Our women's and men's tug-of-war teams uh, defeated Niagara Falls USA teams on Saturday at the 52nd Annual Canada-USA Tug-of-War at the borderline on the Rainbow Bridge. Uh, the women's and men's teams uh, both won 2-0 in a best 2 out of 3 scenario. And the men's, um, it, it, and the bridge was packed, so they, they take two lanes going into the U.S., close them off, take the two lanes coming from the U.S. and so people can get back and forth. But our side of the bridge was packed where the sidewalk is. And uh, we had a marching band from the parking area behind the Ripley's, believe it or not. And we had a full pipe uh, and drum band and led by flag bearers. And we marched down and the tourists loved it. Um, all the way to the center of the bridge, the U.S. had one piper. <laughs> so, um, but the men's, it was, it was like two or three inches from going over the line to tie it 1-1. And the Canadians uh, dug deep and uh, pulled it back. And just, it was amazing how quick that uh, came back to our side. So 2-0. So in the last 40 years, uh, our Niagara Regional Police men's team has only lost twice. And this is the second year for the women's team. And they're 2-0. So we congratulate them. Uh, Councillor Butters is not here this evening. Is there any questions with regards to Regional Council? Councillor Brunel. Uh, uh, yes, Your Worship. Just uh, Main Street uh, still has not been swept, washed, hosed down. Um, I'm not sure when they've done it in years past, but the rest of the city, our crews have done a great job in the downtown, but uh, just noticed it yesterday, still nothing done. I uh, didn't get a chance to pass that to Councillor Butters by email, but if you both could look into it. Thank you. Uh, Chris, have you heard anything? Have they um, spoken to you? To you, Mr. Mayor, to the rest of the council, no, no, no word yet from regional. And regional okay. staff hasn't given any indication to us yet as to when. We have actually assisted them in the past, but they haven't made a request yet. Okay. I'll uh, contact staff in the morning. Actually, I'll probably come and see you. Maybe we'll phone together and make sure we get that done. And if they do need our assistance, again, we have no issue with that. So, good. Okay, Councillor? Yes. Councillor Demery? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, just, I would actually like to know if we have an update as far as uh, getting a date 
for the uh, rail crossing to be fixed, uh, you know, the famous one. Yes. Chris? <laughs> to you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demerate, she's actually stealing my thunder. That was one of the ones I wanted to bring up. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we actually had notification from Trillium uh, today, and they have it scheduled for the first week in June. Okay. All right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Councillor Claylor. Um, I just wanted to ask, I spoke at the last, at our last meeting regarding the crosswalk at Clarence Street at the Market Crosswalk. Oh, this is Regional Council. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. That's okay. I thought we were going on no, to that. No, no, thank you. <laughs> anything else for, uh, for the region? Okay, anything to add, Chris, anything else uh, with regards to the region? No? No, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. All right. Councillor's uh, issues. <laughs> Councillor Clayla. I had requested at the last meeting when, uh, during this time uh, regarding the crosswalk at the Clarence Street Marketplace, um, regarding bringing a motion forward to see what, if we could do, add something um, to add a little bit more of a safety feature to it. Unfortunately, it didn't get put on the agenda this evening, so I would like to ask that could we please um, direct council, or excuse me, direct staff to, or I want to make a motion, I guess, to direct staff to, to ask them to come forward with recommendations on how to address safety concerns at the crossover. I'm still getting calls, I've still been there, seeing things happening. And, and as I said last time, I think it doesn't necessarily have to be cones, pylons, it can be cross guards. I've had like, several suggestions brought forward to me of different things we can do for education. So I just hope that maybe staff could put something together what they think might work the best. Um, maybe Friday mornings, market mornings would probably be the best time. Um, it's, it's just not getting any better. We got to figure out what to do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I get a seconder to that, Councillor Bruno? Chris, to you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Claylith and the rest of Council. Um, staff is currently putting together some details on that. We'd like to bring a report back to Council with a recommendation based on what our findings are um, and some of the costs that would be associated with whatever those recommendations would be. Okay, Councillor, on this, on this, okay, Councillor Borgard. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Chris, Mr. Lee. Will you be getting regional comments on that as well? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Borgard, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, they have some experience with some of those temporary installs, as Councillor Kalilia has indicated, um, and we want to get feedback from them and recommendations on the spacing, the numbers required, and things of that nature. They've had some experience in that, so we want to tap into that experience. Okay. Okay, Councillor. Any other questions on, on that issue? Okay. Thank you. All those in favor of coming back with a report? That's clear. Uh, Councillors? Anything? Councillor Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was going to bring this up under um, item 8 that I pulled, but it might be a better time to do it here. Um, I had a call from a lady who um, was inquiring if the city could do anything um, to make businesses uh, make their entrances and that um, more accessible for people with disabilities. Um, she had suffered an injury uh, on a door that uh, that wasn't accessible, and she was on, and she didn't leave me her phone number, and it didn't come up. So that's why I'm bringing that up. Um, so I just wondered, from staff's perspective, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but does the city, can the city, uh, impose or or tell businesses that they have to uh, make their their entrances accessible? And, um, or when does that kick in? So maybe, I don't know whether it's Chris or Dan that, that could do that, uh, answer that? Yeah. Um, yes. So Carrie McIntosh leads our accessibility advisory um, committee. Mm -hmm. So do you have anything to add, Carrie, on this one? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. Um, yes, so the city cannot actually force a business to become more accessible in any fashion. 
other than if they are doing a major renovation or if they are doing a new build. Um, at that point, under the Ontario Building Code, there are requirements that they have to meet. Um, there are always ways that a business can go above and beyond the Ontario Building Code, and I would encourage any resident or business owner who would like to learn about some ideas to give the Accessibility Committee a call, and they'd be happy to consult. Okay, Councillor? Yeah, because I know when I served on that as Councillor, um, for, for a number of years, we actually did some reach outs uh, with our uh, committee to businesses. So, and I know I went through it when I re redid my building down the street that we made sure it was uh, fully accessible because that's what the rules were. But, but I know that you can't, if somebody doesn't want to do it, uh, unfortunately there's nothing we can do. But, but education is a good thing, so I, I'm sure the committee will continue to do that. Councillor Demery? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, actually, this is to the uh, accessibility issue as well. Um, I, I believe I received the same call. Uh, and I think I was very clear in letting her know that that, that is definitely a problem. And I was aware that uh, we couldn't force the business to be more access accessible. But I told her that she could take that um, in hand and either make it very public that the business isn't, isn't accessible or even sue if she needs to because she's obviously suffered an injury and there are people who do. Um, it would be very helpful if a store is, it is not accessible, they should at least post where the danger areas are because it is, it is a problem for some people. Once you're hurt, it's a little bit late. You know, so uh, there has to be ways to make it safer for people. But yeah, she was, uh, she was very upset about that, but uh, I, I said that we can't do everything, so. Okay, I'd also just like to add that um, there are different incentives from time to time available um, through the Enabling Accessibility Fund for businesses, not for profits, that may want to become more accessible. Also, if you happen to be located within one of our CIP areas um, and are doing, for instance, a storefront renovation, that you could possibly incorporate some of that renovation to make more accessible into your plans. So that's always an option too, and you should contact our planning department about that. Okay. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, could we maybe um, do something about marketing, you know, a little bit of this, like get it, getting out there and spreading that word? Because I, I'm sure that there are many, I, I wasn't aware of that little piece, and, and I'm sure there are many people that weren't. So getting that word out may help things. Yeah, if we get the Chamber of Commerce, the two BIA districts, they can talk to their businesses. Um, also, because I know in the past uh, our, our uh, committee members did some Chamber of Commerce uh, lunch and learn days. Uh, we used to have that. Um, so, And we can also consult the committee, obviously, to, to give us a hand with that. Councillor Bruno? Thank you, Worship. I have an announcement and uh, three... Oh, is this on this issue? Sorry, no. So, okay. No, no, is that it? No, no. No, no, I just want to make sure. Is that it for this issue? Okay, Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just an announcement. Councillor Danch and I will be uh, holding a Ward 3 meeting um, Wednesday night, May 15th, at the uh, Wilson Archives building. Uh, that's between the library and the museum. Um, this will be our first together, and I'm sure um, you'll probably be one of the better uh, meetings that you'd want to attend. If you have nothing to do on a Wednesday night, uh, Frank and I will... We'll, we'll be there taking questions. Uh, just on, oddly enough on, on handicap and accessibility, um, on the weekend I received a phone call from someone who, who would be well known to everyone here, but she asked me not to mention her name. She has um, had two issues accessibility-wise. One was, and I don't know what, um, whether, whether this carries you or, 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 or Chris or Ashley is if a merchant has a handicap accessible door with a button, but it opens, but in this case, closes at an accelerated rate. So you can imagine when they're halfway through the door, it's closing. And I don't know if that's um, just us bringing it to the attention of the owner, in this case it's a chain, um, or if the city actually is the conduit to speak to the individual store. Staff, Kerry, do you have an answer for that? Through you, Mr. Mayor to Councilor Bruno, um, that's something I would have to look into and report back to you. I'm not sure what um, what businesses have to do as far as requirements for um, accessible features that are already in place. Okay. Um, and just I was going to ask Ashley, but she's not here. Um, her other concern was um, 
she was at the marina on the weekend, and I, I popped in on Sunday just to verify our um, paddle on the outside and on the inside on the ground floor door going up to Don Cherry's was not working. Um, so it could be a breaker, they've been shut down, they just opened um, on the weekend, but I'm wondering if we could look into that. Okay. You got that one, Scott? Uh, I got that one. Okay. okay. And through you to Chris. Chris, just on the whole, um, if you're going to be talking to the region or the mayor is, when they do, maybe to both of you, when they do um, Main Street, just to not get in this whole jurisdictional thing, there's the Weir Bridge. And I know that's the Seaways property. Be ashamed to not get it done at once. I don't know if one can do it for the other, whether there's that agreement or not. But I um, wanted to note that this, the bridge itself needs cleaning uh, in terms of the shoulders. On and that one, to you, Gary. Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councilor Bruno, if we are requested by the region to do the works, it's the city of Park Coburn's roadway. We'll take care of it. Be good. So, Mr. Mayor, if you can <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll work put on that, that through. And uh, just finally, uh, through you to Chris. Chris, thanks for getting the paving list out quickly. I just wanted to touch base on what we talked about, about the uh, laterals in case they go on to the public side. Uh, those streets that are being paid, you'll probably plane them first, so it might be a while. But do you anticipate getting the uh, testing of the laterals done prior to the paving? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruno. Uh, all, it seems that all of you are stealing my thunder tonight. <laughs> um, because uh, I wanted to inform Council that the uh, water distribution's leak detection program has already started. Oh, We're already uh, into week two. Um, that being said, um, with the new program and with the, and the technologies that we now are using, um, we've actually found uh, over half a dozen leaks on both the service side and on the mains. Um, we received the notification from the contractor slash leak detection company uh, late last week that we had one specific location. Uh, staff today fixed two of those major leaks on the trunk mains, on our distribution mains, I should say. And so those have been expedited just today alone, and we have uh, a couple of other services that we're going to be working on in the rest of the week. We're still out there searching. So the program is proving to be fruitful. So we'll have the, uh, the streets that are being paid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also a secondary part of the, of the investigation process, and which is the, the module or nodal system that we're bringing in. So that has, uh, that's an even more sophisticated technology that will allow us to hear of, of all the services. So we'll be going through the whole system and picking up all of that. And then once those repairs are done, then obviously we'll be doing reinstatements and whatever on the streets. The reason I'd ask that, Chris, only was because I, I think in years past, I think we've actually not started paving until later in the summer, and oddly enough, the year that we're doing leak detection for those laterals, it looks like we're starting uh, at the front end. So I just wanted to make sure that got covered up. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mayor Bruno. Well, staff will be attempting to address the uh, resurfacing program as we had indicated, so those are targets for us. But if we notice, if you'll notice in there that it's actually some of the areas that have not been targeted for resurfacing are areas where we think we may potentially have. It's where the older mains are located. So we've left them out of the system. Um, it's very similar to how we are not doing everything within the nickel area because we still have warranty issues there, so we're dealing with that first. Once those are completed and we address those repairs as necessary, then we'll be into those areas. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councilor Baggett? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have first one thank you to the fire department. They came to my house last week, knocked on my door, and I uh, wanted to know if I wanted an inspection. Wife was down the street with her granddaughter, so I figured, well, I could let you in. <laughs> Not that I have a dirty house. <laughs> but they came in, and um, they were very polite, and uh, they inspected all my fire detectors. They were fine. They, I had one that I thought was okay, but they said, no, you have to put it over here. They put one in there. 
I owed the fire chief 10 bucks, but I paid those guys right away. So <laughs> they should have gave you the 10 bucks. <laughs> and uh, my carbon, the big thing though was my carbon monoxide detector. I had it on my main floor of my house. And I thought I read everything on the news and read the, watched the newspaper or watched the evening news. And no, it's got a, it should be upstairs in the bedrooms. And they definitely they relocate, relocated it for me. And uh, I do appreciate it to the fire department for doing that. Uh, my issues are, um, first, the, the Weir Bridge crossing, the Kalali Street. Uh, I just want to make sure, Chris, this has been going on for past council, that the work that's going to get done on this crossing, we don't have to put bump signs up after we fixed it, like Main Street. You know what I mean? Like, it's got to be smooth. Like, hopefully, our, if we have engineering, I don't know if our engineering firm or company cities in there or the region I got no idea but I think I do a quality job that's what I'm asking Chris through you mr. mayor to uh, Councillor beg you um, I know for f a fact that the regional staff has been on site with Trillium and they have picked the uh, cutbacks areas where they're going to mill so that it's as smooth a job as possible given the conditions of the bridge and the tracks and everything else so I know the region is taking that into consideration in their examination and they're part of the process so uh, I, will, I personally have faith in them getting it right, so. Good. We'll make sure, though. Was the region the ones on the Weir Bridge also, or were they somebody else? That was a seaway. The Main Street one. That was a seaway? Oh, so. Region or seaway? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Maggie. That involved both the St. Lawrence Seaway and the region. Okay, so maybe in a few years we get them together again and fix that. <laughs> Remove those bump signs. Uh, my other issue is uh, probably to the mayor and see oh the transient problem we're having again this year. It's starting again. There's been a couple of issues downtown area. There's been actually a fight. That was a short fight, but it was between two transients. Uh, another one where people are. I can't say why, but. A lot of swearing going on, yelling at people, driving their cars, and uh, just being a nuisance. And uh, I know I remember, I recollect you mentioned you had a plan or something, or you're the CAO for this year for the uh, problem we're having in the old cement plant uh, property. So, yeah, the, the, it was actually the police that have that. They will be working again. Um, I do. T I do want to tell people. If there's an issue, no matter what it is, please call the police. Um, to let it happen is not, not what we want to see. So if there's an issue, whether they're transients or not, if there's an issue going on, please call the police. Um, we have an acting staff sergeant, uh, Aaron Gross. Uh, I spoke to him today at the uh, have a coffee with a cop this morning. So I've got a meeting coming up with him uh, because he's just coming in. Uh, Rob LeBlanc, our staff sergeant, has been seconded to headquarters. Um, we have an inspector off with an illness, and he's taking over for that until uh, the officer's back. So, but Aaron, uh, uh, he's he's up on things. So, I'll I'll speak to him about that. But they do. They, they they're really watching out for this. They're actually, during the winter, there was a gentleman that lived out the old cement property with uh, during the winter. Didn't want any help. So they went out there a few times to make sure he was okay, and he refused any help. So we also have to have agreements with the property owners, uh, as far as the police goes, not the city. They have to have permission from the actual property owner to be able to go on there and do anything. So I know they were working with the new owner of the former cement property. Uh, I believe uh, my last speaking to Rob was that they actually had that permission, so um, they should be fine. So. We will be working uh, with our local police on that. So, on that issue, Councillor? Yes. Mr. Mayor, through you, I'd like to actually, I'm going to steal some thunder. I thought maybe uh, our CAO would announce this, but he hasn't. So, I want to tell you of something that's been going on, and it, it does address this issue. 
back in February, I met with our fire chief and our CAO and discussed about the whole community safety issue. And we talked about the lights. We talked about a lot of different things and how we could move forward this summer. And I had some really nice news this past week. I, was spot, I met with um, Scott and he told me that I, I had asked him again where things stood. And he told me he had talked with the senior, um, all of the, the directors in our, our own city staff, and that going forward, we're kind of putting it out there that we're asking everybody to um, be always have your eyes we always have your eyes open. It's not about anyone doing any kind of interventions whatsoever, but city staff are being asked to just keep your eyes open and if you see anything untoward at all, to, to call the police. And I, I'm going to be meeting with Michelle to talk to her about perhaps some kind of a plan just to put that phone number out there because I keep hearing from people they don't know the number to call. And um, I had already talked to Rob actually before he went off, and he was in agreement with it, thought it was a great idea. Um, the chief came up with the idea, not just the fire department, it should be all of our departments, and everybody embraced it, and, and I'm really, really thrilled to hear about it. And I think the more eyes we have on the road this summer, the better, night and day. And the whole adage will be that you just pick up the phone and you call, or they contact someone if they see something untoward. But I think we need to spread it to our whole community. It, it shouldn't be just a city hall project. I need, think it needs to be a whole community project. And we need to really get the word out to people that if they see something or something just untoward, that they're not sure of what's going on or something out of the ordinary, pick up the phone and phone because we kept hearing that we're not calling. The police aren't hearing from us. They haven't got the numbers. And if they want, it, they want to know the problems and see where they're happening, we really need to let them know. Thank you, and I want to thank Scott very much for, for taking care of that and talking, and the chief is at the back, and I know they were very supportive of it, and I think it's a good step forward for the summer coming. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anything to add to that? Sure. <clears throat> well, I guess through your worship, uh, further Councillor Clay at this point, and I guess I was going to be able to mention that, but I don't get to go until council is all, all over, so it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's your initiative, and I think it's important, and I think... You know, it's not a silver bullet solution, but every little bit helps. So this, the idea here is, in, in, after hours, as crews are out on the road, you know, firefighters doing the smoke detector program, water main breaks, you know, even someone from the marina driving between the marina property and a store downtown, that they'll sort of cruise down the city streets. Now, the fire department does have the advantage of having uh, radio contact with dispatchers, but these other workers will have to use a phone and report this to report any kind of suspicious activity or things of that nature to the police. So it's just one more tool that I think the city has at its disposal, and hopefully in concert with everything else, it will help to uh, you know, address some of the issues that we've experienced in the past. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Councillor? Yep. Councillor, am I right? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have uh, a few uh, issues to, to speak about tonight. Uh, number one, I would uh, really appreciate it if someone from staff could uh, get a hold of Snyder Dock Services and just remind them that the gypsum needs to be attended the way that it used to. It, the, there's a lot of complaints about blowing dust and uh, it is getting out of control. Right now with all the rain, I don't think it's a big issue, but it will be as soon as it dries up. So uh, if we could just remind them again that they need to go back on their spraying program, uh, that will help a lot. Um, another. Uh, Another issue that we have is the painting of the lines. Is that going to happen anytime soon on the roads, uh, Chris? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Demery, we've actually uh, gone to tender on that. We got some pricing back, and we are negotiating with the contractor because the pricing was much higher than before. Uh -huh. And so we're either negotiate we've ne in negotiations with the the low bidder, and if that doesn't work out, we're looking at alternative sources. Sure. Okay, well, uh, Welland Street is, again, the issue, uh, as it usually gets to be. I don't know why that wears out quicker, but I actually had somebody coming at me head-on the other day, so I, it's really time to deal with that one. That, that's a real problem. So there's that. Um, now, I really am hoping that I'm going to be stealing your thunder on this one. I'm, just, I'm going to ask you. I really am hoping. <laughs> um, I, want, I just wanted to know if you have an update on the uh, bike path walking trail that uh, was being discussed with staff to go down Welland Street, come off the trail, go down Welland Street, and head over to Nickel Beach? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor <coughs> Demery. We've actually, staff has had uh, meetings on this already. Um, we've had discussions internally how the thought process is going to work. 
Um, I assume you're talking about the grant funds that we were talking about earlier. Certainly part of it, yes. yes. And that being said, is that uh, engineering and operations will be coming up with a design and we'll be bringing that back to both the community services group and then from there to council and there'll be some uh, input from all sides on that before we get down to a final award of any contract. Uh, that's very good to hear, thank you. So at least you know it's going forward and hopefully we can have that in place before the 2021 games? Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Denver, that's definitely perfect. Thank you so much. So not thunder, but a lot of wind. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> not, all right. Um, You're another, talking about Chris, I'm not just, you, right? No, I'm just talking about <laughs> the weather. That's it. Okay. So the other one uh, I wanted to speak about too was, um, or ask about, was the uh, CAO's working group to deal with the community safety issues. Um, and certainly I didn't realize that uh, Councillor Kalalev was was working on this, um, but I just uh, would like to know something, any anything that's going on right now, because people in the community are asking about it. Uh, in particular, people that sat at that table. Uh, so maybe it's time to either have a meeting or at least be brought up on, on it. So through your worship to Councilor Demeray, I, I I mean it's my full intention to have another meeting of that group. As you'll know, um, Councilor. Elliot gave his spot to you in the last term of yeah. council. I was hoping for a situation where you kept your spot, but one of the councillors, presumably Councillor Clayliff, could uh, also sit. I mean, I all told there's four councillors, and I don't. I think that might be too top heavy. But if I could get one from each ward, that would be really good. So, by way of an update, uh, the mayor had a very good tour in the after being sworn in of the police. Um, there's an acronym, but it's the video monitoring, yes. uh, video surveillance monitoring facility that's at the new police station. Came back, told me all about it. I went down there and uh, had a tour myself and saw the work that they're doing monitoring cameras. The police are now monitoring um, city owned or police owned cameras in St. Catharines. They're also monitoring or planning to monitor very soon some privately owned cameras at retail stores. So and what they do with these cameras is they're, uh, they're not an enforcement tool, they're an aid to the constables who are out on the road. So in the example that the mayor shared a little while ago, um, the, the, the dispatchers and, and I guess people who are monitoring the cameras were able to direct the police to, to the exact person who was the perpetrator of uh, I guess a crime and, and, and help. So, we had a lot of talk at the budget meeting. This was a coming. This is coming out of the budget meeting. We had a lot of talk about surveillance. We had a lot of talk about funding for the initiatives of that committee. That committee themselves asked for a one percent tax levy to be directed to their initiatives, yes. and council decided not to do that. Well, in my conversations with uh, the police, there's an idea that for a very, very, very small price, a few thousand dollars per camera, we could start a small program. Um, sort of begin in earnest, like with one camera placement, and they can help us with locations. A lot of the things that we thought a consultant would do for a lot of money can be done in-house at the NRP for a cost savings for the city, and the cameras can be deployed sort of incrementally as budget allows, and they will monitor the cameras. So that is one thing that I've been working on that I wanted to bring forward to the committee now that I've had that meeting with a gentleman who uh, heads up that department for NRP. I think that I can schedule another meeting of the working group and sort of talk about next steps and what we can do. We've also had in the winter time, uh, speaking of transients and, and squatters and trespassers, a meeting between the St. Lawrence Seaway staff as a big property owner, obviously in Port Colborne, valet staff, because mm -hmm. they own quite a lot of vacant land and uh, uh, city police, city lawyer, or sorry, regional police, city bylaw, uh, city lawyer, myself, parks department, about how we will handle complaints about trespassers and how we'll compl uh, handle complaints about abandoned debris and drug paraphernalia. And that conversation was very successful. We've put some practices in place that will get uh, a response, whether the activities on private property, city property, 
or one of those two property owners that I've already mentioned, which are also private, but a different sort of private property. So I want to bring all those things back to the committee and have a meeting before the summer really gets into full swing. That's, that's great. I, I do thank you for that. And I would have no problem giving my seat up to Councillor Clay. Uh, there's, believe me, I have lots to do. So that's, that's not a problem. Um, I, but the East Village in particular uh, does need to be brought into consideration again. It's not just about the downtown area. This is you know, much more. Citywide. Than that. It's citywide. It really is. Uh, so without a doubt that. But if you could let the councillors know what is decided as to um, how you're going to deal with drug paraphernalia and that sort of thing, it would be a good idea because we're the ones who get those calls. Mm. So, uh, and you know, that, that is a, a, an issue, but thank you. Just, so. just before you switch issues and in, in uh, going through the surveillance uh, department at, at mm -hmm. NRP and when Scott went through, their system is exactly the same system we use here uh, for the cameras. So we can actually take our current cameras that are attached to any of our buildings yeah. and they can monitor, we can tie them in with them which is actually what we're, we're looking at, so that it's a start, so that, you know, when our staff has an issue at the valet center, or the city mm -hmm. hall, or the marina, or wherever it may be where we have existing cameras, with them being tied in, as, as the CAO said, it can give them that moment's notice of what the heck's going on and who might be involved, yeah. so. It's a great thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's one other, though. One other one that this is a pretty easy one. I don't usually come asking for picnic tables, <laughs> but I do have a request uh, from Port Cares. The Port Cares Board is, uh, and, and their, their uh, funding group is uh, putting on an event. It's called Rock the Night, and it will happen at the Reach Out Center um, over on the east side on Nickel Street. Um, it's quite an event. It's a major fundraiser. It's going to be on June 14th. They need eight picnic tables. Um, I know we have done it in the past for others, and I would like to know if we can do that for them. Free of charge. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question on that? Motion from council. So, through your worship to council, uh, this request has come before council in the past from schools and whatnot. It's yes. a deviation from city policy. Uh, I can do it. I just need a motion from council that's voted on and carried. I'll move it. Okay. I'll so I need it. a I need a mover to waive procedure. And then we can take a motion. Okay. So Councilor Demeray, Councilor Bruno, questions to that? Councilor? So just kind of a practical question where I think this is a good idea, but they should be sending a request to the city and it would show up on our agenda. And am I, is that the way it usually works? Um, maybe you can so take this part. <laughs> through, through your worship to Councilor Bodner, Typically, we get these in writing, and they're dealt with as a yes. correspondence item. This one came in as an email. So because it was an email, I think Councillor Demeray is bringing it up verbally because we don't have a printed letter. I mean, ideally, it would be a printed letter and dealt with as a, as a, as a correspondence item, which is still a motion of council. It's a resolution of council. We're just doing it here as a verbal motion by waiving procedure to allow it to happen without a notice of motion. Okay. So it's I just, really just procedural. I just wouldn't like to see councillors getting <coughs> all the requests and then have to bring them here and we got a waive procedure. You know, I'm just practically, it, I think it should happen the way it always happens, but I understand. But it still seems like a long ways off. Couldn't they just send a letter in? If we need one. You know, I, I'm sure I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm not trying I, to make it difficult. <laughs> I just don't want to see it get to... Uh, too weird in the future. No, so I, I do Hot suggest stick. I do suggest to council that when you get these, yeah. have them contact the clerk's office, and the clerk will direct them into the proper procedure of the city. Yeah. Right. And, and I think we would do that in, uh, in the future. This is probably because um, both the CAO and I are board members, and I think that's that's why it came to us. Yeah. It came that way. But for future, if we can do it that, just to keep with the procedure. So we have a motion on the floor to waive procedure for this. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed. That's carried. Main mo or a motion then. Thank you. All right. I would move that the city provide eight picnic tables uh, and waive the fees for that on June fourteenth and deliver them to, um, I believe it is sixty one Nickel uh, Nickel Street in any case. The reach out center. Um, we normally don't deliver. I think we 
have those organizations pick them up. Okay, we'll find a way to get that. Which I believe what okay. is what, what Carter does. So we'll does. just wait the access, because Frank, you picked yeah. them up for the schools, yes. Okay, so we'll, uh, if we can waive the fees, Fee. I'll just move that, and we'll find someone to pick them up. Okay, so I need a seconder. Councillor Bruno, any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Okay. You're done? That's it. I'm done. Okay. Councillor Wells, you're all set? Okay. Before we go to consideration of items requiring separate discussion, oh, sorry? I got staff response. Oh, you got some staff response? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Sorry. So I'll go to the CAO for staff responses. <laughs> I know they destroyed your. <laughs> I kind of got that one, yeah. Uh, just two items today, Your Worship. I would like to welcome to her first ever council meeting our new director of corporate services, Brenda Garrett. Brenda started on Monday. Most council will know her because she was at the strategic plan on Monday and Tuesday but for the benefit of the public and the video um, stream of our, of our uh, council meetings, Brenda is our new Director of Corporate Services. She comes from a wide background of, of uh, I guess, finance positions at three levels of government. Uh, we're looking forward to her replacing Peter, who's agreed to stay on for a month of overlap and help to indoctrinate her <laughs> into the Port Colburn ways. And, uh, and like I said, you'll see Brenda at the meetings from now on. I've released Peter from the next council meeting for a personal uh, obligation that he has that night. So we won't see Peter on Monday the 27th, but we'll have him back for a little retirement party for sure. And second, unless Brenda wants to say anything, do you want to say anything? Um, just want to say I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's, uh, it's a great, um, I'm happy to work for Scott and uh, through Scott to, to help council. Um, very positive environment. Um, very happy to be um, in to the, strategic, to, to the strategic planning session. It'll give me a good base and, of uh, council priorities. And I'm really grateful that I have um, Peter here for a whole month uh, to, to transition me into the new role. And, I'm looking forward to him telling me where that secret drawer is. <laughs> so second of all, keeping in practice, uh, keeping in keeping with the new practice uh, that I support of sharing our professional development uh, conferences and whatnot, I did attend on behalf of the city on Thursday and Friday, the Ontario Municipal Administrators Association Spring Workshop entitled Leadership Methods Using Metrics and Momentum. There were sessions on uh, technology, employee engagement surveys, using metrics for success, um, municipal workforce, uh, a, a legal update on legal issues that are emerging. Uh, we did have a visit from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. He touched on a couple of government initiatives, including the governance review. And on Friday, I was a presenter at the conference talking about case studies for asset management. So. Our finance staff told me everything I needed to know so that I could go and tell the other CAOs everything they needed to know. <laughs> so, and that is it. Any questions to the CAO? Okay, I think everybody's taking your thunder tonight, Chris. You don't have anything to add, I don't think. Peter, do you need anything to say? You're all set? Dan, nothing? Okay. And now that we are item 13, considerations for items requiring separate discussion, we'll take a five minute recess before that. We stretch our legs for that. Just thought of that Main Street thing today. Have we ever done it before? I mean, I used to see them out.
that's the issue when you look after those and not third party, yeah. like like at the chamber. Or yeah, yeah. It's only as good as it. Session. So item six is the first item withdrawn. Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Uh, CA Report 2019-69, um, Provincial Modernization Grant. Okay, seconder to that. Councillor Bodner, Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Um, great explanation about um, what's in the process of spending that 700000 plus money with no conditions from the province. That's a great... Uh, Great program to be able to partake of. So congratulations for uh, for that. Um, fully concur with on um, communications and all the things that uh, is going to be attempted to be resolved there. My question was, uh, really, if we don't spend all of that, um, what's the process to use up the balance of that money, and does it have a time limit? Scott. Thank you, through your worship to Councillor Bruno. So as, as I know, as um, to the best of my knowledge, there is no time limit. This money has actually already been flowed to the city. So we're holding it in reserve, um, pending council approval of what to spend it on. So as I mentioned in the very first paragraph, they, you know, the, the provinces sort of give us a bit of a mixed message. They say this money is unconditional. You can do whatever, whatever you want with it. I suppose we could pave a road or some kind of capital project but they have said it's their wish to see it go into that service delivery, modernization, customer service sort of vein. And that's why the projects that I've recommended here are along that vein, because I think the province wants to see cooperation at the municipal level with their initiatives. So as you know, and as mentioned in the report, there are not dollar figures attached to these numbers. And the main reason is because we just didn't have time to tender out, say, a website job or something like that. We have an idea of, of where things will end up. We think there's plenty of money here. And to your point, Councillor Bruno, there will be leftover money. The process that I envision coming forward is going to senior staff for more uh, customers, or sorry, service delivery enhancement type initiatives. For example, engaging IT staff. And second of all, looking back at the, the strategic plan that will hopefully be before council after the exercise that we started last Monday and Tuesday and aligning whatever funds are left over with customer service initiatives that are identified in there, therein. Um, but in, in any circumstance, coming to council to get those funds unlocked. So once funds go into a reserve, we can only spend them through either a budget allocation or a staff report to get them out of reserves and into uh, actually, a, you know, into production. So you will see a report before you that says, hey, the first, you know, the first round of projects use two thirds, there's one third left. Staff recommend using the one third for these projects. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Item eight is uh, Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Accessibility Advisory Committee, we request for proclamation of Access Awareness Week, May 31st to June 6, 2019. Thank you, Councillor. Seconder for that? Councillor Wells? Councillor Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I pulled this because I'm the new kid on the block and a member of this committee. Uh, so um, I believe our first meeting is coming up very soon. So um, we may be able to work on some of those initiatives we talked about tonight. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions to that? All those in favor? That's carried. Mm -hmm. Item number nine, Councillor Clayoff. Memorandum from Nancy Giles, <coughs> EA, EA to CAO and Mayor Staff Liaison to the Grant Policy Committee, re-recommendations of Grant Policy Committee. And I just went down and I wanted to ask. Oh, oh. Uh, I'm just going to get a seconder. It's okay. Uh, seconder is Councillor Bodger. <coughs> Go ahead, Councillor Clayoff. I just had a question, actually. I, I wondered on the Niagara Health Foundation, I'm not sure what a spirit bed is. 
Does anyone know? I looked it up and Googled it, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> Councilor Bruno? Uh, on the committee, but just to that, it was in the body of their request, okay. but I can't recall it from memory. But I could get back to you on it. That's okay. I'll find it somewhere. Anyway. Actually, if you can contact Nancy, and she'll have, because she has all the, app, there was a, a whole uh, slew of information with regards to that, so. I wonder, I, I found some information on it, but what I found wasn't what I thought would, they would really be buying, that's why I wondered. And my second one was just, on the Port Colburn Feline Initiative, is that the same as the feral cat, or that's a different group? Same. So, so I just wanted to question. We we didn't give them their grant. We we wanted to report from them prior to giving them a grant. We said this year. Did we get a report or submission? No, we received a submission from them. Yes. But initially, when they had put it in in the budget, there was one piece that came out, and we said the feral grant cat program was one that we we asked them to give us a report. That's all. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, at the budget time, we, the council agreed that uh, it would not be part of the operating budget, that we wouldn't be providing a grant to them through that process, but referred them to the grant committee to put an application into the grant committee so, for them to review. Okay. And this is where it Thank is. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Demare first, then Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just going to say that uh, that was a $5,000 uh, item on the levy that we took off and suggested to the Fero Cat people that they go to the granting committee to have get the money there instead. And then we end up giving them half of that. So um, at least they do have some work they can do in the community, but it's unfortunate that they're not going to be able to do what they would have. Yeah. Councilor Bruno. Um, thank you, Worship. I just thought of this as this came up. Thank you for raising this, uh, Councilor Califf. Um, the committee from time to time reviews its policies and procedures. And one of the things we want to be doing now is, and I'd be happy to have see if Nancy could send it around to all of you, is um, we want to do kind of an upgrade on it. I have personally been approached by a member of a neighboring council who is struggling through how they proceed with permissive grants. And it is much like we used to, where a whole bunch of groups would show up at a budget meeting and make their requests at the time. Um, I told them of what we had done back in the 90s uh, to get this going, and uh, I certainly didn't want to uh, pass it on without A, the approval of the committee, uh, B, it kind of being looked at again to be tightened up. There are some shortcomings that every year we pick up in the policy. So I've asked members of the committee to, um, prior to um, the next tranche of money, to review the policies and procedures. I'd love to share it, Nancy, to share it with the council. Go through it with a fine tooth comb. If you see anything that we could do to better serve the community and the, and the grant um, applicants. Um, we've done a lot of good revisions through the years, but it's, it's time to give it another thorough rummage and, and tighten it up. So um, I'll be happy to pass that along to members of council. Okay, any other questions? All those in favor? That's carried. These groups will actually be invited out um, in the near future to uh, receive their uh, checks. Item 13, Council Borgard. Region of Niagara, RE Niagara Housing Statement, Affordable Housing Data, PDS 17 2019. Thank you. Can I get a seconder for that? <laughs> Councilor Demare. Councilor Borgard. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to everyone else in council, that uh, this report, I was really, really happy to actually see it and to uh, hear about what the regions, what they were doing and collecting this data. And so I ask that our CAO, if possible, could come to, uh, can ask the region if they can come and present this information as it relates to Port Colburn to Council? Scott? Sure, so through your worship to Councillor Beauregard, um, we have had different staff from the housing, uh, from housing at the region come to um, the Social Determinants of Health Committee. So we have a subcommittee of Council that includes some social service agencies and community partners that has talked to uh, Jeff Sinclair 
who is a staff person at the region, as well as um, through their initiative, some planning staff at St. Catharines where there's action plans around housing. But uh, Mr. Sinclair in particular is a valuable resource and I can reach out to him uh, and see if he's, or actually the staff who've prepared this report and see if there's somebody who can come to council. Um, probably the best way is just a motion from you, seconded and carried to direct me to ask the region to come to council and then we'll find a date that works. Councillor Demery, I know you're good man. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, just a, a quick question. Um, is it our practice normally to attach the various reports um, to the minutes of the, the committees? Because we we had this this report had been received by the Social Determinants of Health Committee quite a, quite a time back, and was I, I had thought transferred to council through their committee meeting, meeting minutes. But uh, is is that normally what happens, uh, Madam Clerk? Uh, usually, just the minutes are uh, attached. Okay, so we're going to have to find a creative way to make sure some of these reports get to council because this was really quite. I mean, Councillor Bogart's correct. It's it's important uh, information. Okay. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll find a way to do that creatively in, in the committee. <laughs> Thank you. Through the mayor, uh, anytime you wish to have additional uh, information come to council, you can just request it at your committee and pass a motion, and then the staff member will pass it on. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So, Councillor, do you want to put that motion forward to have the CAO, uh, probably the people that presented to us, well, Councillor, that he's, yeah, he's, can come back if if he's available or he's so, yeah. He, he so, do you want to do that? Yes, I, I would. I would like to do that. Okay. So, to bring uh, Jeff Sinclair, or if he's not available, somebody to 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 do this. Do you want to second that, Councillor? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any questions to the motion to bring? Uh, regional staff here no questions all those in favor that's carried okay so back to the main motion that we receive the correspondence uh, which we have a mover and a seconder for all those in favor that's carried thank you item 14 uh, Councilor Baggy. Thank, thank you Mr. Mayor Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority regarding NPCA board composition well, okay, uh, seconder for that. Councillor Bruno. Councillor Baggy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple points here. Um, I read the Alberta what matrix for uh, Alberta Public Agencies matrix for it's a matrix for getting board members that they think would be a positive uh, influence on the, MP on the NPCA board. <clears throat> I just want to stress that uh, as a past member of the board on the NPCA, <clears throat> and I know a lot of past board members, what's missing in that matrix is having a heart. You have to have a real passion for the environment, you have to have a passion for cons conservation, and you have to have a passion for volunteering. And uh, I just want to make that point because the matrix makes it look like a, say a white collar board. It just, just, just the way I read it, maybe that's all. Anyways, um, <clears throat> the other issue is the um, extending the uh, times of the 12 members until the appeal by the city of Hamilton is complete and the agreement between the three municipalities is finalized. Uh, my question is, would they have an approximate estimate on the, the date that the city of Hamilton's appeal will be complete? Like, are we talking years? <laughs> no, I'll tell you that in a second. <laughs> okay. So Hamilton lost the appeal, yeah. and uh, the money that they were to give to the MPCA, which they actually paid and was put into reserve, um, actually stays with the MPCA. So that court case is over. Today, uh, the... Um, they said it could be up to 27 members, although everybody believes that 27 is way too many for this board. So yeah. right now you're going to have the uh, region of Hall or County of Haldeman, uh, region of Niagara, and the city of Hamilton <coughs> sit down and go through the numbers and dollars to donuts. It'll come back to where it is yeah. today. So, um, but that'll be coming. This is a motion that, although it does say it was seconded by Member Foster, uh, he had left for another meeting. 
It was actually uh, Member Johnson from Hamilton. Her and I um, uh, put this together during our, our meeting and uh, came back to the board with it. And uh, that's what the board passed uh, with regards to this. So uh, some of this stuff has been complete, uh, but this is going to the region of Niagara. So there'll be some things. And we felt that uh, through um, Gail Wood, uh, our acting CAO, um, and her staff, that's who brought forward the Alberta uh, public agencies uh, for the board and commission profile. It's not to state that we'd have to follow it verbatim, but it gives us a good guideline and it can give the region a guideline. Um, and a lot of this has already come out at several meetings that we've talked about, both at the regional level and the NPCA level. So uh, those things have been discussed at those levels. So um, that'll be coming back. And I know the governance committee within that Brad Clark chairs will be um, they're coming back with a number of initiatives too. So, so you'll see that. Uh, uh, well, depending on when the, the three bodies get together and get this yeah. hammered out, so yeah. which I think will be short. Yeah. Oh. One okay. other thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Ontario government's website. They're asking for input now for Ontarians regarding the Conservation Act, mm -hmm. and everything to do with conservation authorities. So. And I've been watching the MPCA meetings and nothing's been announced that the government is asking for input. So I just wanted to make sure it's on until May 20th and then it closes. So mm -hmm. that's all I'd like to say. Okay, good. Thank you, Councillor. Question? Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. So, Mr. Mayor, can people still apply for the board? Or is it already, has it been... No, Are I would. The applications in or not even started or. No, some on? some municipalities have gone through a process. Some haven't. Um, but really, what we were waiting to do is find out what the numbers were, let these court cases go through, and then the region will direct each municipality to to come back to them. So, um, but I think you better let them negotiate first, because what Haldeman has done in, in Hamilton, they've actually doubled their membership. So they went from two to four in Hamilton and one to two in Haldeman without any negotiations. So the board itself, we've discussed it, have no issues with that. Um, but we still want the three organizations to sit down at the table and make sure everything is correct coming forward. So once that's all done. Now, if they change the Conservation Act, some of this may be moot. We don't, we don't know. That's just a process that they're going through. So, all right. So as soon as we hear about it, we'll let you know. Oh. Yeah, that'll come down. Yeah, no, Barb and I'll Barb and I'll Barb and I'll will bring that. Well, it'll probably come back as a as a direction from the from the regional council too. So, okay. Okay, that's it for items. Uh, any notices of motion? Yep, Councillor Walls. Uh, to you, Your Worship, um, I have. Um, I've been working with uh, Sherry Hansen and Officer LaPlante in regards to uh, modifying and amending uh, the discharge of firearms and the uh, inclusion of the, or the Tannerite in the uh, noise uh, bylaws. So I, we're looking at having those come back somewhere toward the end of June. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Councillor? On that issue, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, it's only a notice of motion. So. Right, but... I, yeah, yeah, uh, okay, well, I can... So if you say tannerite, um, are we including uh, light products in that? Is it going to, or is it? Are you just naming that product because there's another one that is also available out there that acts the same way? So I, did, I wouldn't want to see us do something and then exclude this one thing that's still out there. So uh, uh, through your worship, yep. um, they are classified under the Explosive Act as a S27 explosive, so they'll be okay. addressed as that with an example of Tanner right in okay. the other names, okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, good. Yep. Thank you, Councillor. Any other notices of motion? Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I'd uh, just like to um, announce that the notice of motion I presented at the last council meeting uh, having to do with the uh, quarry lands. Um, I will be withdrawing that notice of motion and um, expecting to be able to present an amendment possibly on the 27th, depending on, on staff recommendation. Okay, good, okay. thank you. Any other notices of motion? 
Seeing none, motion to adjourn this portion of the meeting. Councillor Danch, Councillor Beauregard, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. We'll call, we'll call the uh, Committee of the Whole Council meeting to order. Introduction of addendum items. Madam Clerk. Uh, just the same as before, the removal of item one. Okay. Confirmation of agenda, mover and a seconder. Councillor Bruno, Councillor Bagu, questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Any disclosures of interest? Okay. Adoption of minutes, I have two. Special meeting of Council 11-19 held on April the 15th, 2019. Regular meeting of Council 12-19 held on April the 23rd, 2019. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Beauregard, Councillor Clayliff, any questions? All those in favor? That's, that's carried. <laughs> any determination of items requiring separate discussion? Uh, approval of all the items. Move and a seconder. Councillor Wells, Councillor Demeray. Any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Proclamations. We have one proclamation. Access Awareness Week is May 31st to June the 6th of 2019. I get a mover and a seconder. Councillor Demeray, Councillor Bruno, any questions? No, Councillor Bonner, no questions? No. Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Well, his hand was going. Oh, I didn't want to deprive him of his speech. <laughs> uh, we have minutes of boards, commissions, and committees. We have two. We have the minutes of the uh, Port Coburn Transit Advisory Committee meeting of January 23rd, 2019 and the minutes of the Port Coburn Historical Marine Museum Board of Management meeting of 2019, or March 29, March 19th, 2019. Ooh, it's a mouthful. Uh, those in block, mover and a seconder, Councillor Danch, Councillor Bodner. Any questions to either of those? Just a reminder that your name is still on there as banishment, Councillor Bruno, on the museum. And, <laughs> did you? Okay, it sounds, oh, that's good. That's good. Maybe, maybe you won't be on the next minutes. All those in favor? That's carried. Consideration of bylaws, Madam Clerk. Uh, bylaw 6679-43-19, being a bylaw to appoint a treasurer, a.k.a. the bylaw to replace Peter. 6680-44-19, being a bylaw to <laughs> Being a bylaw to appoint a deputy clerk, uh, 6681-45-19. Uh, being a bylaw to temporarily close section of various streets to vehicular traffic for the purpose of the ninth annual Port Colburn Art Crawl. Uh, bylaw 6682-49-19. Being a bylaw to set the levy, set and levy the rates of taxation for the city for city purposes for the year uh, 2019. Uh, bylaw 6683-47-19, being a bylaw to authorize entering into a development agreement with Robert and Mary Ann Bosley regarding uh, Cedar Bay Road, and 6684-48-19, uh, being a bylaw to appoint Amy Dayball and Allison Martin as municipal law enforcement officers, and lastly, 6585-49-19, uh, being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Colborn at a special and regular means of May 13, 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And just a reminder that the first two bylaws strike Peter from the records. Can we do something with the old badge? The old badge? Yeah, yeah we could do that. Uh, if I can do these in block, I'm moving a seconder. Councillor Wells, Councillor Beauregard, any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. You're done, Peter. You're, you're, up. you're officially out now. <laughs> okay, so upcoming meetings. On Monday, the May the 27th, we have Committee of the Whole and Council starting at 6.30. Monday, June 10th, uh, Committee of the Whole and Council starting at 6.30. Monday, June 24th, uh, our next meetings uh, of all Committee and Council. And again, they're all here, and they start at 6.30. Just a reminder for the public. Mover to adjourn. Councilor Danch, Councilor Beauregard, any questions? All those in favor? Great. Good meeting, ladies and gentlemen. Very good meeting.